Okay, a few, a few uh, preliminary things. Um, first of all, I keep forgetting to mention uh, some internship opportunities that I want, want to make sure people know about. Uh, may especially be useful for, uh, for someone else who are still trying to decide what they want to do this summer. Uh, one is at the uh, California Public Utilities Commission where I work. Uh, there are internships available in uh, both the uh, legal division, uh, working uh, directly with litigating lawyers, and also uh, in the administrative law judge division, which is where I work, uh, uh, in, in effect clerking for judges during the summer. Uh, and if anybody's interested in exploring uh, the PUC opportunities that, <laughs> I don't know if you can read it, there are a couple of email addresses I put on the board. It's mpo at cpuc.ca.gov, and then the other one is srt at cpuc.ca.gov. Um, if you s send a, an email to both of those addresses, one is for Mar Marcello Poirier, who is in legal division, and the other is for Sarah Thomas in the administrative law judge division. And, uh, and if you are interested in that, I'd encourage you to get on that fairly soon. Um, the other internship opportunity I wanted to let you know about is uh, at the, in case you haven't heard about it yet, is at the uh, San Francisco City Attorney's Office. Uh, it's, uh, if, and if, if you're not familiar with that office, let me, let me just tell you that it's like almost no other city attorney's office I've ever seen. It's, uh, it has a very large, very competent uh, a group of attorneys, and they get very heavily involved in public policy issues, including energy and other environmental issues. And uh, uh, my understanding is that they've actually set aside a small number of, uh, of internship uh, slots for uh, Bolt students. Uh, and, and if you want to pursue those, the deadline uh, is the uh, 8th of February. So you have a little over a week for that. And uh, if you're interested about that, uh, that internship, I'd suggest you send an email to Rick Frank, the, dir the uh, director of the Sea Health and Environmental Law uh, Center, and ask him for the contact information. Um, and uh, so any questions about either of those? Um, thank you. Do you, have a, do you have a name placard here? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Got it. Okay. And uh, the other thing I wanted to do was uh, let you know about some stuff that's coming up. In class, uh, first of all, uh, uh, attendance, of course, in this class is actually always critically important as far as I'm concerned. But I want to emphasize that, that of the classes that it's important to come to, the next two weeks are particularly important. So I encourage you to plan to be here. Uh, because next week I'm going to be talking, among other things, about uh, rate design issues. And at the end of the class, I'll be handing out a rate design exercise that I'm going to ask you to do in small groups. And then I'm going to ask you to come in and make a very brief, very short presentation in the following class uh, based on what you did in that rate exercise. So, so uh, now the, the material uh, having to do with, with, uh, with, the, with the rate design concepts, there's not a lot in the readings on that. A lot of it's just going to be what I, what I talk to you about in class. So it's going to be fairly important to be here. Uh, but I also wanted to, to mention that uh, we are going to be having some guest lectures this semester. There are a few fairly interesting ones that, that uh, what people committed so far to come in and wanted to mention a couple of ways. One is uh, uh, Severin Bornstein, who is uh, an economist uh, who works out of a professor in the Haas School of Business and uh, in very heavily involved in energy economics. He's uh, just come out with uh, uh, a very readable paper having to do with uh, oil prices and what it means in terms of the world economy and and uh, I guess we can come in and talk about that paper and we'll get a chance to read it in advance and then talk to him about it. Uh, uh, a second guest lecture that will come in is uh, a woman named Stephanie Smith, who's the, who's the uh, senior energy reporter for the Wall Street Journal. And I'm asked her to come in on the day we're talking about nuclear power. I specifically wanted to talk about that subject, even though there's a lot of things she's very good at talking about, uh, because uh, you know, there is there's a renewed discussion about toward uh, building more nuclear plants. And it's a discussion that's probably a little bit more lively in some other states than it might be in California. And uh, Stephanie Smith is, is very much uh, exposed to that discussion going on in other parts of the country. Uh, another, another guest that's going to come in is uh, one of the uh, commissioners from the California Public Utilities Commission, Diane Grunick, who uh, is probably one of the national
she's going to come in uh, convening land and energy efficiency day, and she'll be talking to you about what California is doing with our state and, 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 and what the conversation has been uh, that she's had with people in other countries on the topic. Uh, and then also we'll have uh, a natural gas expert uh, who will come in uh, on natural gas day uh, and talk, talk to us about what's been happening with gas supply in the country. So I uh, want to give you a little bit of taste of some of these things that are coming up. And, um, and I guess the other, the other important, important piece of early business I've been, did I get your paper yet? No. If I get your paper, you want to grab your placket? Um, sure. Um, would, would be to see if anybody has um, heard any energy in the news this week. Anything they want to report in? Right. Yeah, nothing else to do. <laughs> <laughs> Accelerated, all of the sticker options were absorbed, and now, now Rebecca says there's a secondary market for those stickers and, and a higher value placed on, on used cars that, uh, that have the stickers. It's a very, very interesting public policy issue as far as I'm concerned. First of all, before they established this sticker incentive, sales for Priuses was going up all on its own. Was, people were, were realizing that it, that it was a, a favorable option that that particular hybrid at least was seem to be working fairly well. It cost more than a maybe a comparably sized car that it wasn't the hybrid, but it wasn't outrageously more expensive. So it was doing fairly well. It was calmly building up. So there's, there's number one, there's a question as whether you really needed to provide an extra incentive at all. But then there's this issue of whether it's really consistent with the concept of diamond lanes to have uh, encourage people to be solo drivers <coughs> in a Prius. I mean, think about it for a minute. California and the Bay Bridge, for instance, in order to use the diamond lane, you have to have three people in the car. So if you've got a car that, say, averages 20 miles a gallon on the freeway, and you've got three people in the car, I mean, one way to think of it is you're getting 60 miles a gallon. You've got three people taking advantage of that 20 miles per gallon. Well, if you have a Prius, and let's say it's making 45 miles a gallon, and you've only got one person in the car, you know, you're, you're really not getting as much, as much efficiency per passenger as you get out of some of these diamond lanes. So why are we encouraging people to take solo trips to the diamond lane? Tyler? On the other hand, if it encourages people to drive the, uh, to buy the Prius instead of another car, and assuming they take other trips in a non-commuting or a non-diamond lane, then I mean, you're getting more bang for your buck that way. So. That's, a, that's a good point. Tyler's saying, well, you, you know, people are going to use the car for purposes other than being in the diamond lane, and you're going to have they get an advantage out of that. Yeah, actually with the Prius or uh, with most of the hybrids now, you're gonna get more of an advantage out of those other trips because they actually get better mileage stop and go than they do on, on, in a freeway situation. So I think that's that's a really good point. You are leveraging the advantage you're getting out of, out of that purchase decision. Um, Harry? Um, well, I'm not sure I support the policy uh, behind the diamond lanes anyway. Um, I've heard that it doesn't really um, help traffic. Just um, privileges those yeah. who meet the uh, different criteria for it. Um, and I mean, you can also look at it in, uh, from the privileged perspective that you know, people who can, uh, people who can afford to buy a Prius are basically paying for this privilege. And people um, who don't have the funds to you know, splurge on this type of car. Right, so two questions really. One is, are diamond lanes good policy to begin with? And the other is, uh, aren't you really providing the opportunity for people a lot of money to yeah. buy their way into the privileged position of using the carpool lane? You know, you, 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 so you got an equity question as well. Teresa, do you have your hand up there as well? Uh, well just in relation to another um, kind of news item. Another, another news item? Good. Get off of the hybrids. We'll be there all day. <laughs> all right. Go ahead. Um, 
I'm sorry? The blizzards in China, the cold streams in Russia from, um, I, I guess, providing southern and central China with coal um, to areas in the north that experienced severe disruption. There's a, there's a disruption, a disruption, disruption in, in supply of coal in China. China. I'm sorry? The, the railway, the railway line. The railway line. So they have been able to distribute the coal and there's been like blackouts. Uh-huh. So this is an interesting thing because, you know, the, at least the folklore, I don't know where the facts lie, is that you're getting about one more coal plant a week built in China. So it's much, a very fast growing reliance on coal. And uh, Patrice is saying that you know, there's been a cutoff of supply. And suddenly with this very heavy dependence on the fuel source, you've got a reliability problem. Um, so, sort of the backstory behind that. Uh, so, my calculations. I was worked for NRDC in, in China last year, right. and um, calculations there look like it's more like one every two and a half, one new coal fired power plant every two and a half days of 300 megawatt capacity. Um, okay, so, so, so I grossly under exaggerated. Well, the news sources do in general. Uh, that's the New York Times number that was put out a couple of years ago. And people uh -huh. just stuck with it because they don't have anything more solid than that. Chinese yeah. statistics are known for their inaccuracy. Um, so, so you're saying basically it's about 100 plants a year that they're adding? Yep. Okay. 100, mega, 100 gigawatts um, per year is about okay. average for the last couple of years. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that's about um, what they estimate is, well, an expert that I talked with was two 300 megawatt power plants and one 600 megawatt power plants a week. Mm -hmm. um, so a uh, lot going on, but like Patrice was saying, blizzards now, um, as well as like sort of poor quality railway lines have cut off supplies of coal, mm -hmm. and so cities are starting to have to undergo mandatory um, shutoffs uh, in order to stop black, uh, blackouts and brownouts. Um, so that's a huge problem, especially right now, because it's the holiday season, and the holiday yeah. season is coming up, so everybody's trying to get home to their families and spend time with them and stuff like that. So. Right, so you know, so again, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's an example of, of, of over reliance on one tech, one uh, one fuel source. I mean, the, the right. Diversity of fuel source is a really big factor if you want to want to keep keep the lights on. And as, you're, as Christopher's pointing out, it has huge economic implications. But the Chinese government is pretty aware of this. So in the last year, they've passed a, a renewable energy law or a new uh, they reformed the renewable energy law. They're creating a new energy sort of an overdue energy law. They've got a lot of coal. And talking about the fact that they're really just getting to getting the point now where they're starting to evolve some of the, uh, the governance structure that you need to make, make a, a, a decent energy policy happen if you're gonna, in terms of, of, uh, of being, able, being able to have the knowledge base to know you want to promote diversity and figuring out how to do that. <coughs> and uh, so it's, it's, a, it's a very important thing to watch. Okay. Yes, this week uh, several heavy storm calls damages in many China. And people think uh, the, uh, there are many uh, transportation and uh, energy utilities controlled by the central government uh, that the natural monopoly cause, uh, makes the situation become worse. So I'm thinking about uh, the, the, how to enhance the ability of monopoly uh, to deal with this kind of uh, catastrophe. You're asking, you're asking a really good question. I guess if I'm understanding you're saying, you know, when you have a monopoly and you have the opportunity for government to have some involvement in terms of shaping the activities of that monopoly, what can you do to try to to guard against the kind of uh, kind of energy emergency that we're having right now? Uh, and it's great because we'll be talking a little bit about further about that, I think, as we go through the day-to-day, -day especially. Uh, and make sure we get back to it if you don't hear any hear, hear an answer to the question. Max? Um, front page of the New York Times today was an article about South Africa having power outages because uh, they just don't have enough production. And so now it's it's having a major impact slowing down their economy. And they're having rolling blackouts that shed load. And, mm -hmm. um, so. The rolling black, blackouts in South Africa, too. And yeah. what's, what's, the, what's underlying this? Uh, I think they say that it was that the uh, post-apartheid presidents failed to um, bring it to start 
you know, increasing uh, permitting for new power plants at a rate that would sustain the economic growth of South Africa, which has been pretty substantial and accounts for like a, a large portion, of, like something like a third of Sub-Saharan Africa's uh, economic growth is in South Africa. So it's just not keeping pace. And so, so they're not planning adequately or they're not acting on the Yeah, that's, just, that's the level of detail they go into. Shell just announced their um, 2007 uh, uh, profits um, today, and they, they've done 33 and a third trillion dollars. Shell's profits were 33 and a third trillion dollars. Can, can, you, can you put that in the scale and what uh, kind of a percentage? <laughs> it can't be 13. What was this? What period are you talking about? Their profits. Maybe that's gross. Okay. Sorry. Uh, yes, you, you know. For what period are you talking about? 2007, I believe. Uh, Sorry, I just glanced over the headline. That sounds impressive. <laughs> yeah. Well, they, they were. Just, I don't know. There are actually a few skeptical people in the classroom. <laughs> so let's, let's we'll look into that together and see what we can figure out. We can talk about it next time. Anything else? Okay. Uh, last, uh, I'll just report on one thing, which was last time I mentioned a non news item, which was that the, uh, the <coughs> economic recovery package that was agreed on by, uh, by the leaders of Congress and by the President uh, did not contain any extensions of the tax credits that currently exist for renewable energy development but are scheduled to expire at the end of this year. Well, that was last week's news. Today's news is that, oh, I'm sorry, the next thing that happened was a State of the Union address when uh, President Bush said, among other things, you better not tinker with that package. We've got a deal here. And if you start loading it up with stuff, you know, it's not, I don't know if it's going to be viable. He didn't quite use the veto word, I don't think, but he got pretty close to it. So that, that happened uh, after the pre-implementation. And then today, the Senate announced that uh, it's reinserted tax credit extensions into the, uh, into the package on the Senate, at Senate level. And uh, they're only going for one-year extensions at this point. So currently, the, the, the production tax credit, for instance, is scheduled to expire at the end of this year. And so you can imagine what impact that has had on, for instance, development of new wind projects, where they know that if they don't aren't in production by the end of this year, and then there's a gap of time in which the credits aren't available, that they might, might be out of luck. So you can imagine people have been holding off on some development. And now they, there's a chance that the whistle may blow again and they've got one more year to try to get in there without knowing for sure whether there'll be a broader extension beyond that. Well, uh, the, what the Senate's doing is not a sure thing either. Not only does the President discourage them from doing it, but there's a question as to whether uh, they're actually going to be able to survive a closure vote, closure vote changes to the package. You know how it works in the Senate, even though you only need 51, uh, 50 percent plus of the vote in order to pass something, uh, any individual from senator can try to, to uh, filibuster a bill, keep it from coming up for a vote. And so the new way to break a filibuster is with 60 votes. So in, in reality, even though you need only 51 to enact a law, you really need 60 to even have a vote on the law. Right? So the question is, are there 60 votes to support putting the tax credit extension? And that's something that's going to be tested in the next few days. We don't have an answer to that yet. Well, uh, I wanted to, to uh, go back and kind of uh, finish up a few things uh, uh, from our discussion about economics at the end of the last class. And uh, I'll try to run through it fairly quickly because I want to make sure we have time for the things that we have on our plate for today. Uh, but I also want to make sure that we're all fairly much up to speed on these concepts. Uh, and uh, you know, I also encourage you to, to talk to me or one of your colleagues who studied economics if, uh, if this is still more confusing than clear by the time we're done. So let, let, let's start by just running through a few things that ought to be fairly easy to swallow. First of all, let's talk about the con concept of average cost. What's an average cost? What does that mean? Anybody have a thought about that? All right, well, let's, let's say you, uh, you've gone out and, and acquired uh, supplies in order to get 50 things. I'm going to try not to say widgets today. You get 50 things, you got the supplies for them, and, and that cost, they, to do that costs you $100 to get all those supplies, right? And so if you only are going to have 50 of them, then you can average that cost out and you've got a cost of $2. 
That's a simple one. Cost you hundred dollars to get to get the supplies. There are fifty units. Each one's got an average cost of two dollars. With me so far? All right. Well, that, that's not very interesting. It gets a little more interesting though if then you go out and get some other supplies. And let's say for the next fifty, you have to go out and spend two hundred dollars. All right. So you do your division here, and for those, that fifty, on average, it's costing you four dollars. But the question we're really going to ask is, overall, for the sales you're going to have, you're going to sell all these 100, what's your average cost? Right? So the average cost is $100 plus $200, 300, divided by 100 units. So you have an average cost of $2. Well, that's coincidental that it actually turned out to be did I do my math wrong? <laughs> just testing it. Pay your pay attention. This is good. All right, so yes, yeah, so it's $3. So it's not coincidental. So you see, so you got, you got an interesting number here. All right? Uh, where's Josh? Have you taken any classes from uh, Robert Reich yet? Yes. Yeah? Well, leadership and self performance. Yeah? Well, I have a question to ask you. Does, at the beginning of the, any of the classes, did he walk in and ask everybody if they had any epiphanies yet? That's something he used to do. I took classes from him. Pardon? <laughs> okay, Josh has confessed that he skipped a lot of classes. So, all right, um, so, but the other thing is about, about uh, Professor Rice, he's not only a very distinguished professor, but he's, he's, uh, he's not as tall as a lot of people are. In fact, he's, he's extremely short, and he's the first person will point that out to you. And uh, what, but what he says is that, that, that if you take his height, and Shaquille O'Neal's height and add them together and divide by two, he's six feet tall. Right? <laughs> so it's, it's, you know, that's an average, but it's not a very interesting piece of information when one of the people involved is over seven feet tall. And so same question here. You, you, you've got an average price. And if you want to make sure that you're going to collect all the money you need to pay off for all your goods, pay off all your goods, then you're probably going to want to charge at least $3, right? And that's going to cover your, your costs. But, uh, but what's missing here is an understanding of the fact that it's really costing more than three dollars to get those last units in there, right? And we'll talk about what that means in the utility context later. But so right now, I just want to introduce the notion of average cost. All right. So then the next question is, what's marginal cost? All right. You know, let's use the same example. If you're if you if you sold 50 units and you're gonna and you're gonna sell a 51st unit, um, what's your marginal cost? Four dollars. It's Sarah? just it's the cost of the next one to produce. So if you're at that 50 mark and you've already dealt with the all the two dollar ones, then yeah. beyond that. Yeah. So Sarah's saying, well, the cost is is four dollars. The marginal cost. Yeah. If we're assuming that you can get you can buy only one for for additional four right. dollars or two for additional eight dollars, whatever. Yeah, that you know the marginal cost is the cost of that next unit of production, and you can ask that question at any point in time. Remember, I did mention at the end at, during our discussion last time that economics is really the art of looking from a certain vantage point at something. You know, you, you always have to ask, what point in time are you doing this? Who are you? Who's the one who's doing it? And so, if again you're at the end of that fiftieth unit and you're asking what's the marginal cost, the marginal cost is going to be. Four dollars. Okay. All right. Um, all right. Let's let's get a couple of somewhat related concepts in there. Fixed costs. All right. Um, well, let, let me put two things up there. Fixed costs and variable costs. And can someone tell me what is the difference between a fixed cost and a variable cost? Variable costs vary. Yeah, that variable costs vary, okay? <laughs> that, 
that's a good C minus answer. It's okay. <laughs> so, so, all, right, so, um, all right, so just to, to use an example, um, I live uh, near, corner, near, fairly close to where Claremont Avenue hits College Avenue in Berkeley, and there's a big Safeway there. And, and I love watching the activity in that Safeway because at any particular time at the next corner, they're, they're usually about uh, you know 20, not 20, maybe five or 10 freshmen, and each one of them has four uh, plastic bags, and they're sitting there waiting for the bus. You see? And so I, I, like, I like watching what's going on there. But that Safeway is open 24 hours a day, and it didn't used to be that way. It used to close at 10 at night, whatever. And then somebody woke up one day and said, hey, wait a second. We've got a fixed cost related to this facility, and, and, it, and it's not going to change. You know, we've got, we got the building. We have to keep the lights on because we don't, we don't want to make the building look, look unoccupied and, and, and make it dangerous. We've got to keep the refrigeration units going for all the stuff in the cooler and the freezer. So the store is just sitting there, and, and, uh, and, and, and if, it's, if it's closed, it's obviously not making us any money. So the question is, can we make enough revenue between 10 in the morning at night rather than seven in the morning to justify having a night shift, right? So they figure, well, what's the, what's the cost to have a night shift in terms of salary and benefits? And that, in effect, is going to be their variable cost. Yeah, they may be a little bit more. If you're running the cash registers at night, you have to have electricity for that. And there's some other little things. But, but fundamentally, they have, they, they're asking themselves, is it worth our while to pay someone a salary, variable cost, in order to, make, to keep the store open? And it's a very simple calculus. And I'm assuming, unless they got a C minus in math, that basically they figured they, they found out that they were getting at least enough revenue to pay off uh, to pay off the uh, employees who are in the store. Right? So that's fixed and variable cost. Um, and that's good. So so with, with with these fundamentals in mind, let's go back and look at the look at the graphs a little bit again. And maybe I'll try to speed the process up a bit by showing you some graphs I made before instead of necessarily drawing them. We talked about, uh, let me st start, start up a step. We're going to start with a few steps. Okay, we talked about competitive markets. We talked about what the uh, presumed conditions are that apply in a perfectly competitive market that would produce the results that are conveyed on this graph. We've got, we've got a, a demand curve, which is actually a straight line in this case, which is going uh, down from left to right, and we have a marginal cost curve that goes up from left to right. And uh, the demand curve, of course, reflects how much people are willing to pay depending on the quantity that they're purchasing. How much they're willing to pay per unit depending on the quantity of something that they're purchasing. That's, that's an expression of demand. And then the marginal cost curve says, this is how, how, this is how many I'm willing to sell uh, based on what it costs me to produce them. Now, uh, before we go any further, what, let, let me check with what we just talked about in terms of variable and fixed costs. On that marginal cost curve, what's the question they're asking? Is it a variable cost question or is it a fixed cost question? What costs are they looking at when they're talking about marginal cost? <coughs> variable? Highlight. Yeah, variable. In other words, the fixed costs, are, that's water under the bridge. They, they've already... They've already paid for the facility. It's already there. The Safeway's sitting there. The coolers are running. So, so in terms of question, in terms of how much they're willing to produce and sell, it depends on variable costs. As long as they can cover the variable costs plus something, then they've got some interest in selling. All right? Does that make sense? Is the fixed cost between B and E? <coughs> Sorry, fixed cost is between. It, is it between points B and E? It's fixed cost between points B and E. Well, let's look at that. First of all, let's, let's start. Let's start here by, by, by looking. Let's, let's take get there a couple steps uh, in, in sequence. The box, the black box, or, or the blue. Box, tell me what that represents. <laughs> Can anybody read English? Okay. So if the, this, the, the the shaded area represents total revenue. Can people see why that's the case? In other words, we're talking about this total revenue at that equilibrium point, at that point where supply and demand meet, right? So to go to that point, we say, all right, we've got point B, a uh, little B, and uh, and that at that at that point, if you look over on, on the uh, on the price side, you see that that reflects the price of A, little A. If you 
look at the quantity side, you see it it's, reflects quantity C. Right? So if you multiply quantity C times price A, you're going to get that shaded area was represented by little a, b, c, b. Okay? With me on that? Okay. Now, uh, now this, this is what I think Max is trying to get at. The question is, looking at the curve, how can you understand what the cost part of that is? And, and uh, let me suggest to you that the variable cost is what's represented by That reflects the total variable cost. Okay? Because if you look at the quantity that's being sold, which is quantity C, the question is how much does it cost the producers to produce quantity C? And the answer is that you have to follow up along the marginal cost curve, and it's the area that's underneath the marginal cost curve at that particular quantity level. Questions or corrections are always welcome. Okay. Monica? I have a question. Yeah. Is, it, is the reason that it's rising because as you produce another unit, the marginal cost is going up? The question is, is it rising because as you produce another unit, marginal cost goes up? Yeah, we, talk, we talked about that a little bit last week about the fact that initially you're going to have a situation where as you produce, as you sell more and produce more, the cost, marginal cost is actually going to go down because of the fact that you've got a certain amount of capability to produce goods already, and, and there's a certain price level, a, a certain level of investment, and so the more, more you can sell, the less per unit it's gonna cost you. But that eventually starts trending up. It gets to a point where you have to, here's a safe way, with the sales level of between 10 and 9 to 7 in the morning, it gets really good, they're gonna have to put on more clerks. People clean up the aisles, people run the cash registers, so the cost is gonna, gonna start going up again. For unused sales, right? Yeah, so so that's that's what's reflected here. The assumption that over the course of time, the cost is going to go up as you sell more. Okay. So if if the shaded area here is the variable cost, then the green area represents an excess of variable cost, which is defined as the producer's surplus. Now, is that pure profit? about that for a minute. Is that pure profit? Not necessarily, right? You may need to get into that surplus in order to absorb some of your fixed costs, right? But that's, it's the area in the green that makes this whole enterprise interesting for the sellers. Okay, this is, this is what they have to work with as an excess of the variable cost for, for providing an an increment of goods or services. Elaine, did you have a question? Yeah, I think I think I'm sort of thinking more along the lines of Max. It sort of seems like the marginal cost of the first unit that you produce um, should have the fixed cost in it in some way. Because um, you don't, until you decide you're going to make something, you don't have any fixed cost at all. So, and well, that's, yeah, what, what, yeah, what Elaine is saying is, is it, isn't it true that the Fix, the, the, the fixed cost ought to be reflected in what we're calling the variable cost for the first unit, or, or the marginal cost for the first unit. Yeah, we, you know, we talked about that a little bit last time, right? We talked about a Kool-Aid stand, and you have to pay for the table and the pitcher, and the, the sugar and the glasses. You made all, you had this sunken investment, and, and you spent $10 getting all these supplies together, and you only sell one glass of lemonade, and you want to get all your money back. Well, the marginal cost is $1, is $10, so you got to sell that glass of lemonade And then, and then you, if you can sell another one, your marginal cost goes down because you, 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 don't have, you, don't have, you don't have to spread your costs as, as far, and then it keeps going down until you have to start putting more in in terms of employees or goods or facilities. That's right. Which time? Does it seem like on the other end you could always just build a lemonade stand and then all of a sudden demand drops and figure, you know what, I'm not going to produce any lemonade? And from that standpoint, it's like, for me, your marginal cost is always separate from your fixed cost because it's always like the lemon and the sugar and stuff that goes in that glass of lemonade, not the setup costs of the stand. Right? So, no. 
So Ty Tyler's suggesting, well, once you've already gotten the, the, the stand set up and you bought the glasses and the pitcher, you put up the sign and say Kool-Aid or, or uh, lemonade, whatever it is. Uh, then at, from that point on, you, you ought to be willing to sell a glass of lemonade as long as it's at least going to cover its, uh, your variable cost, right? Right. Yeah, and that's exactly right. It's going to be in your interest to sell lemonade if you can cover your variable costs and start to, to whittle into your fixed costs. And again, it's a matter of perspective. Remember, the question is, when are you asking that question? With Tyler's example, you're asking the question if they've already sunk the cost, sunk the money into the, the physical plant, the table and, 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 the, and the cups and all that. And you're asking yourself on a going forward basis, how much do I need to get to keep doing this? Right? That, you're asking that question then. Now, before you've made that capital investment, you're going to ask a different question, right? You're going to say, well, what do I think I'm going to be able to sell? <laughs> Am I going to be able to sell enough at a, at, a, at a good enough price to actually get a return on my investment? In other words, is it worth for me to plop $10 into this lemonade stand because I think I'm going to be able to sell enough cups of lem lemonade at, at, a, at, a, at a competitive price to get my investment back, right? It's a different question then. It's also a different question once you get to the point where you, you used up all the cups and you used up all the lemons and, and, and you need another pitcher, and you say, all right, do I really want to, do I want to expand this now? Do I want to move into that next level? You know, stores face that all the time. Anybody run to Zachary's Pizza on College Avenue? You know, it's, uh, it's, uh, Zachary's is a very popular Chicago-style pizza place. And you go there almost any night up until 9.30 or so, and people are stuffed almost, you know, they're kind of bursting out the door waiting for tables. And, and they had to face a decision about five years ago where they were going to buy out the vacant storefront that was on, you know, on the side of, of the restaurant and expand into that space. Mm -hmm. you know, and, and I'm sure they were slightly nervous, but well, we're pretty darn successful now. We got all this money flowing in and our costs are relatively manageable and we want to expand. So you know, businesses face that decision all the time. And by the way, I think it worked out for Zachary. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we're still stuffed out the door. Right? Good. Are we closing in on this at all? Still feeling uncomfortable? I guess I just maybe want there to be another line then on the graph that the marginal <laughs> that the marginal cost is the actual marginal cost, but then there's the price at which the person is willing to sell it isn't necessarily the margin the exact same thing as the marginal cost. Uh -huh. I mean, I get that they want to recover the marginal cost, but they also need to recover their fixed cost. Mm -hmm. And so clearly, they can spread those fixed costs out over a larger quantity as we go, you know, further right on the graph. Right. And that's a good thing for them. Um, but that's, I guess, I think maybe that's where my confusion was coming from, was thinking of marginal cost and the price that they're willing to sell yeah. it for is exactly the same thing. So Lane's saying, well, you really need more information than you get by looking at that to, to know whether something's happening in business or not. And, and you know, there are more questions to ask other than, than what's strictly the, the, what the variable cost is uh, for producing more items, because you've got this fixed cost you need to recover. And that's right, and I think, I mean, this is a good, to be struggling over this is a good reflection of what happens in the real world, especially in the real world for energy, because uh, we're going to talk for the, for the rest of today and then for the next time about what's referred to as cost of service regulation, where where you set rates in a manner intended to cover all of the fixed and variable costs uh, that a company is facing. Uh, but then after that, we're going to talk about the introduction of more concepts related uh, affecting comp competition. You start moving to competition, and you go out and you and you and you. Uh, uh, you buy the power you need from some competitive generating station instead of the ones that are just owned and operated by the utility. And then people start blurring those lines between variable costs and fixed costs, between marginal costs and average costs, and they all, they all get very blurred. Uh, and, uh, and some people say, well, as long as, as uh, that competitive generator can charge enough in the market to cover its variable costs, then that's good, that, that works out well. And then other people say, yeah, but they've got all these fixed costs, and if they don't think they're going to be able to recover those fixed costs, they're not going to want to get into the market. Right? And, and so then there's a debate about how much tolerance there ought to be for fluctuation in the price. You know, if, if, it's really, if, it's, if the price on average winds up being very low, down in the area where it's maybe just barely covering variable costs, then should you have some tolerance for prices going way up sometimes in order to give generator enough revenue to get to get their fixed cost return, to get back their investment on the capital capital investment in their plan. Or maybe I'm jumping too far ahead, but I, but I guess I'm saying is these are good questions and good tensions to have because of you know it affects the public policy discussion and goes on in this area as well.
we'll get back to that. All right, moving along in this concept of, of, of things depending on the managed form. Now, remember, remember in these, these charts, of, uh, graphs up to now, we're looking at a competitive industry. And we're looking at it from the bird's eye view of the entire industry. Okay? And now I want to look at, we want to look at one firm in a competitive market. What does one firm face in terms of, of the way uh, the demand curve looks? All right, now, and, and let me suggest to you that to a, an individual firm in a truly competitive market, demand looks like a flat line. Now, what's that flat line communicate? It says, I don't care how many of the units you're going to offer individual firm. But the I in the marketplace, I'm only going to be willing to pay you one price. This is the price I'm going to be willing to pay you. This is that, that, uh, halfway up that curve right there. And, and I'm not going to pay you any more, so don't charge me more. Now, why can they say that? Why can, it, why can, it, can the marketplace, why can, why can things, consumers say that to an individual firm? Because in theory, we're in this environment where there's uh, easy ease of entry and exit. There are lots of, of suppliers. The project pr product is relatively interchangeable with another product. Project product, in other words, it's not pizza. And um, er Erica did. A, where is Erica today? Oh, there you are. She, she found this great website where they actually describe the different kinds of pizza that there are. You know, like at least twenty distinct <laughs> varieties of pizza. So. I felt very vindicated, <laughs> and, and so, so uh, you know, it's 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 a it's a fungible product. There are lots of firms coming in and coming out. There's really good information available, right? So the consumers know where else they can go to get it, and they know what price is being charged. And again, in this competitive market, we've reached this point of equilibrium, right? The price is where it ought to be to reflect true demand and reflect what suppliers are willing to supply. So, in other words, you've got a price that's been established by the interaction of consumers and suppliers in a competitive market. So then one individual firm has to decide where they're going to set their price. And the answer is, you don't get much of a choice about it. Because you, this is, you, you, have, you have to take the price that people are going to be willing to pay. And when you understand that price, then you understand how much you should be willing to supply. Because you look at your own marginal cost curve, you look at the way your costs vary as you change the supplies, and you know that you don't really want to sell any more units uh, than, uh, than would be reflected by the intersection of those two lines. You know, why is that true? I mean, think about it for a minute. If the, if the firm was going to decide, well, to heck with it, with it we're going to put more we're going to put more units into the market than would be reflected at that point of that, that intersection point. Well, then what happens is you go out further in quantity and draw a line up to the marginal cost curve. You'll see that the marginal cost is higher than that price that the consumers are willing to pay. Right? Because if you're going to charge that high price, they'll just go to someone else. Because right? they don't, they, there are lots of other firms that are needed by the unit. <clears throat> and and so, so that's, that's the way the world looks from, from the vantage point of an individual firm. Why is the marginal curve going steadily up? Like I would think um, if you um, have an economy of scale, yeah. marginal cost would go down. The question is why, why would the uh, curve go steadily up? Well, first of all, it's not going to go up in a straight line. These are definitely very simplified graphs. But why is it going up instead of going down? And the answer, I think, to that partially comes from what this particular competitive industry is not. I mean, it is a competitive industry, which means it's not an industry that has <coughs> continuing, continually lower market costs. By definition, it's not. We'll get to that in a couple of minutes. So hang on your question, and we'll see if it get answer, gets answered. Anything else? All right. Now, um, we're going to talk about monopolies. And before we get too lost in this, let's let's talk about that concept that I was just introducing to Harry, which is that there's some some enterprises where uh, the more units you're providing, the more service you're providing, the more goods you're providing, the lower your unit cost is, right? And we talked a little bit about this last time. Um, 
instead of having a marginal cost curve that goes up like this, the kind of firm we're talking about now is going to have a marginal cost curve that's going to go to something like more like that. It's going to be, be becoming uh, lower and lower in kind of an asymptotic way as you sell more of the goods. Uh, and we refer to that as a natural monopoly. This is the kind of business where you're better, everybody's better off if you have only one provider than, if, than they would be if you had lots of providers. So why is that true? Because this one provider can continually have a lower price the more and more it sells. So if it sells less, the price is going to be higher. And people don't want a higher price, they want a lower price. Right? So that would be a natural monopoly. And we talked a little bit, I think, last time about, we, we mentioned railroads. When they initially built the railroads, they put all this investment into the tracks and the right of way and the gates protecting crossing areas. And then they bought some locomotives and they bought some cars attached to it. And then one passenger shows up and they, you know, marginal cost for that passenger is about you know, $500 million or whatever in dollars in the 1800s. And so, you know, so then they want more customers. So they can continually try to push and more customers. And they're going to be willing to even add more trains and more engineers. Uh, in order to, to serve those customers because they have such a, fix, a big fixed investment already in, in these facilities. Right? And, and so that was considered to be a natural monopoly service. And so was, so was electric service. Because, uh, because as, as technology has improved, we read in the, in the, uh, the, trans, the transmission primer earlier, as technology has continued to improve, uh, the transmission lines could carry more and more power, longer distances. And that allowed the utilities to build bigger power plants in more remote locations. And so they were able to get more power per dollar of investment and then bring it economically across these lines long distance. And that, that kept working for a long time, for many, many years, up until, until the 1970s. There was this kind of relationship where the costs tended to go down and the more and more you produce. And uh, remember when, when, I was, when I was a kid, growing up in Chicago, there were TV commercials for the local electric company, and they featured a, a, a dancing light bulb. You know, it was called Little Bill. Little Bill would dance up and down and sing a song and say that electricity costs less today, you know, than it did many long years ago. And, uh, and they were encouraging people to use more and more electricity. I remember Franklin Roosevelt in his speech in 1932 saying, electricity's terrific, you should use more of it and use it often. And, uh, and so that was the mentality for a very long time. Well, so, so some businesses, some enterprises, you want to have one big fat firm instead of a lot of small ones. That's great. That's the good news. The bad news is if someone is a monopolist, if someone has, is the only source of something, then if left to their own selves, uh, they may not come in with the result you want. Remember this, remember this, uh, remember this curve, the one that's in red, and you can see that. You have the marginal cost and demand curve. That's, that's the one that reflects what would happen if you had a competitive market. But what economists will argue is that a monopolist is not going to come, come in with, the, with an efficient, uh, with the right supply at the right price to meet what would happen in a competitive market. In fact, a monopolist will provide fewer of the good or service and do so at a higher price. Exactly the opposite result that we want to have. Normally, you want to have more goods at a lower price, but you're getting fewer goods at a higher price, right? And and this is where it starts involving a little bit of a leap of faith. Instead of hand, having the the uh, equilibrium point appear at point F there, which is where these two red lines meet, we're going to look at two different lines. And again, I don't think you can measure it out. Now the red line has shifted. You still have the same marginal cost situation. But instead of responding to demand, instead of responding to demand, the monopolist is going to respond to marginal revenue opportunity. So what does that mean? The, the monopolist is going to look at its costs, and it's going to look at how much more money it can make with each new level of investment. And it's going to, going to keep doing that until it gets to a point where marginal costs exceed marginal revenue, and then it's going to stop. Because it's, it's going to be, it would be kind of insane for it to voluntarily want to sell more than it can get money for, right? So it's not going to sell things at a lower price than its costs are. And 
Um, what monopolists will always tell you, in addition, is that marginal revenue curve is always going to be lower than the demand curve. And it's going to keep getting lower and lower. It's going to keep moving further away. It's going to have this kind of relationship where you have a pie wedge and it keeps getting, you get further separation between the demand, demand curve and the marginal revenue curve, depending on the quantity that's being provided. Now, if you're anything like me, that's not intuitive. You don't look at that and say, well, sure, why are you bothering to say that? It makes all the sense in the world. And so, in the readings, they try to give you an example of how that would work so you can kind of play it through in your own mind. And, uh, and I've offered one here as well. You know, in this example, you know, imagine you've got one unit uh, and, and, uh, and you can sell that unit for a dollar. Okay. And, and, the, and the demand curve says, yeah, I'm willing to pay, I'm willing to pay one dollar for one unit. So your marginal revenue is one dollar because if you had zero units, you had no revenue. You sold one unit and now you got a dollar. So you got marginal revenue of one dollar. And then you start moving up through the process. Well, what if I sold two units? Well, the demand curve tells me that no one's going to be willing to spend more than 90 cents per unit to buy two. So I can only start charging 90 cents now. So it's 90 times two, which is $1.80. Well, when I sold one unit, I already had a buck in marginal revenue. So how much additional revenue am I going to get now? Well, it's a $1.80 minus a dollar, right? So it's 80 cents. Okay, and I see what's happened. As you increase the supply, you have to you have to decrease the price you sell it at, and so you're going to have this continually shrinking relationship, where the more you sell, the less you can get per unit, and so the, the basically so the amount of marginal revenue, the amount of additional revenue you get out of selling that incremental unit continues to go down, right? Okay, so that's what's reflected on that marginal revenue line. Because if someone's gone through that calculation in their head and on paper and on a computer and they figured out that that's what happens. The more they sell, the more the marginal revenue goes down. But this, you know, just like it would be true with any, any firm anywhere, they face a marginal cost curve. And so they look at how those revenues shrink and they look at how the marginal costs go up. And they decide, they'll get to that point where those two red lines cross and that's it. They're not going to supply anymore. But if you step back again and look at what was going on, if we pretended this is a competitive market, the marketplace would likely have had quantity, uh, the quantity reflected by that point, that point F there. They want to have that, that, that many units sold and they're willing to pay up to a certain price for it. But because of the, the, the forces of monopoly, you wind up getting fewer units sold and the price winds up being up at B because the demand curve says that they'll tolerate paying that price reflected by the AB line. They'll tolerate paying that much if there's a smaller quantity. Okay, remember we talked last week about New York Times and how at least I as a typical consumer will buy one at a dollar and a quarter and I'm sure as heck not going to buy two. And then, and then I'm willing to maybe buy the, the Chronicle for a quarter if it's a second paper. So, so, uh, so now we don't have the product. We just got the New York Times. And so the question is, what am I willing to spend? All right, I'll give you a buck and a quarter. And so that's what happens in the marketplace. All right, so you're selling fewer than the marketplace wanted, and you're selling it at a higher price. Okay? Not too many scrunch faces. Does that make some sense on some level? All right. Well, maybe it's not a great surprise that that's not the result that people want. When they said, well, we've got this national monopoly, we've got this ability to capture, uh, capture the benefits of, of, uh, of higher efficiency, they didn't want to produce that result. So, so that's when the trade-offs that we talked about from the Hirsch reading last week come into play. We're saying, we'll let you be a monopoly, we'll let you do this because we want to capture those cost efficiencies. But because you're a monopolist and you don't have the force of the marketplace coming to bear to, to, to control your price and, 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 and quantity decisions, we're going to step in, government. We're going to step in and we're going to regulate. And we're going to supplant marketplace forces. We're going to ask the questions that the marketplace would make you ask. And 
do that for you because we're not going to have competitors who are going to try to make you behave. Okay? And that's where we get into the concepts. Well, first of all, all right, we got that, and, and, but I, I, do have to, I do have to get to the elasticity. So let me talk about that for a minute. And then we'll apply this, the concepts we just talked about. All right, now what's elasticity? Anybody tell me? Ah, Rebecca, you almost raised your hand. Okay. Yeah. If I remember it correctly from my school, you know, it's, uh, it's basically it, it refers to demand and whether or not they, demand will change. And some things are thought to have inelastic demand and other things uh, elastic demand too. That's what it refers to. Like, um, they, I think they talk about gas in the book or, or uh -huh. like staples versus lots of Okay, so you're saying it has to do with demand. It definitely does. Let's see how it's reflected. Yeah, we got our demand curve. Where is how is elasticity reflected? It's reflected in the slope of that curve. How deeply pitched is it? How quickly does it go down? And uh, and it's defined as the change in quantity as uh, a ratio of the change in quantity to the change in price. So the question is, as the price changes. How quickly does the quantity change? Right? And something that's, uh, economists define something that's elastic as being something which produces a ratio of 1.0. Right? It says, what that says is that if I change the price by 50%, then the amount that people will buy will change by 50%. Is the electric, in, you think the electric industry is, well, let me, let me put more definition in there. So if something is a 1.0 or greater, it's considered to be relatively elastic. And therefore, if it's a 1 point, at lower 1.0, anywhere lower 1.0, it's considered to be relatively inelastic. And the smaller the fraction is below 1, the more inelastic that particular good or service is. So then let's get to electric power again. You think it, the electric power is particularly elastic or inelastic? Sarah? You say inelastic, I mean, because I mean, we're not going to change how much quantity we use and how much we demand solely based on the price, um, just because we're so dependent and we have like a base dependency upon it. Yeah, Sarah's saying, well, electricity is something we have a big dependency on. When we really depend on something, we're going to be relatively inelastic in responding to, pr to price signals. Because again, if, if you reduced, if you increased the price by 100%, would you reduce the consumption of, of electricity by 100%? Of course not. If it was 50% up, would it be 50% down? Now we're getting more intuitive, gut level about it. But I think you have to say no. And you can look at that in other energy areas. How about gasoline? Uh, how about the price of a barrel of oil? How about the price of a gallon of gasoline? You know, has at that price double within recent memory? Yeah. Has demand been cut in half in recent memory? No. I don't think so. So, so electricity by nature is relatively inelastic. And, and it's, you know, the, how inelastic something is is important. I mean, if something's a 0.9, you're going to be, have one, one thought about the relationship of price and demand. And if it's 0.2, you're going to have another thought about it. If it's you know the fraction's that low, it's very inelastic. Then you know that playing around with with price is not going to do much. So I mean, on a gut level, do you think there's at least some elasticity response to electric demand? If price goes up, are people going to change their behavior somewhat? Sure. Probably. And again, you know, and one of the big questions, one of the big unanswered questions is exactly what is that response going to look like? And we're going to talk about that a lot next week. And when we talk about some of the other some of the techniques that can be used to try to affect behavior. Okay, so um, so uh, just having interrupted my own, my own smooth transition uh, from talking about about this this trade off, this saying, all right, we're going to give you the monopoly, but in exchange for that, we're going to try to be the marketplace. We're going to we're going to impose economic regulation. And what that's going to mean is that we're going to make sure that you charge a price that's appropriate and would be appropriate if you were providing this service in a competitive marketplace. And the question is, how do you figure that out? The prevailing concept 
in the United States has been, for over a century, to uh, set rates to reflect the cost of service, cost of service revenue rate making. And what that means is we're going to give you enough money to cover all of your operating costs, and we're going to give you enough money to get a reasonable return, to allow you to get a reasonable return on your capital investment, on the money you put in the power plants and transmission lines. And that's it. We're going to set the rates in a way that's intended to give you that level of return. So we're going to look at, in other words, at the cost of your providing your service, and we're going to give you the money to cover your cost, cost plus. Give enough money to cover your costs and earn reasonable profit. Okay? All right, so we ought to go over the components of that, what cost of service means, because I think that uh, it helps in the context of our trying to grapple with these cases that I've asked you to read uh, and write about in this week. And so, so let's, let's quickly do that. Uh, I've suggested again that there are really two things that you have to look at. Uh, one, one really fits, fits into this category of, of, of operating expenses or other expenses that are very annual in nature, things that you can say, well, this year, this is what we're going to have to spend for various purposes. And you compare that to the, to the, to the larger capital investments. Um, and and, and so, so, you, so, you get, so we developed this concept of operating costs. And you know, those include things like the salaries of employees and the rent on office buildings and the cost of paper and ink and, and uh, uh, you know, main oh, the cost of fuel for the power plants, uh, things that are going to, again, be annual in nature and that, uh, that you can keep track of on a dollar-for-dollar dollar basis. And <coughs> all right, fine. We're going we're gonna to let you ca ca capture these operating expenses. We'll, we'll, we'll consider that to be part of your reasonable cost, if the expenses are reasonable. We'll talk about that means later, what that means later as well. But then on the other side, you have the operating expenses, but then you also have the capital investments. Because remember, you got that Safeway store sitting there. You got the power plants, you got the transmission lines, you got the office buildings that are in that rental that you own. And so that's that's over here. You've got capital investments. And, and what we do is we, we figure out what the grand total is of all the capital investments that that utility has, has entered into. And we have a name for that. We call it rate base. So how does rate base work? All right, well, uh, let's say that all of the facilities that you own, uh, grand total cost for all the facilities you own is $1,000. So, so in the first year, you've got a rate base of $1,000. All right, and let's say you don't invest in anything else in the next year. So going to look at that $1,000 for a while. Okay, so what's going, to, what's going to appear over here in terms of, of the cost of service reflecting that, that amount of money? All right, well, there are first a couple of things. One is that you're going to be allowed to earn a reasonable return on this investment. Let's say for the sake of argument that that's 10%. You're 10% on your investment. So 10% of $1,000 means Let's say, let's say your operating costs were five hundred dollars, five thousand dollars, and so your earnings for the year are going to be a hundred dollars. All right, so you've got direct, you've got operating costs, and then you've got the return on the investment. Your return is hundred dollars, so that comes over here too. Well, then you know something else about this power plant or this this facilities. They aren't going to last forever. Now, what does a business do in a competitive world? What are they supposed to do? Well, they're supposed to keep books. And in the books, it's supposed to say, well, this is what we've invested in, and this is how much it costs us. And we recognize that these things don't last forever. So we also have to reflect. That's in one side of the ledger. The other side of the ledger, we have to reflect the fact that this value is going to go down over the course of time. What, what was worth $1,000 a year one is not going to necessarily be worth a thousand dollars a year too, because of the fact that it wears out, and over the course of time, we have to fully depreciate that value. We have to reduce it over the course of time. And what you're supposed to do in a competitive firm is keep that in mind. Well, let's see, you know, we're losing value over here, so we need to set aside some money from our earnings 
to replace those facilities and the gun. Because otherwise, you have to, let's say it's a 10 year depreciation. At the end of the 10 year period, you're, otherwise you're gonna have, again, the facilities don't work anymore. You have no money set aside to buy any new stuff and you're out of luck. So a business is supposed to be thinking about that and setting aside money. So we have this concept of depreciation. And again, uh, just for simplicity, even though it probably confuses things a little bit, let's say you're going to depreciate it over a 10-year period. So what that means is that in the second year, you're going to say, well, this facility isn't worth $1,000 anymore. It's only worth $900. Right? So I'm sorry, we take, we take $100 off, it's going to be worth, it was worth $900. Right? Now that's going to result in two things that have to appear over here in the cost of the service. One is, in the second year, you're going to have to reflect the fact that the plant has been partially depreciated. It's been depreciated by $100, so that's going to appear in the raise for the second year. Okay? Let's say you're still earning 10% a year on your investment. Well, now your investment, instead of $1,000, is $900. So you're only earning on a $900 investment, which means instead of getting a return of $100, getting a return of $90. Okay. So, uh, and that and that continues to function that way. If you don't invest in any other facilities, your rate base will continue to shrink. You'll be earning on less on less investment, and you'll just be carrying that that amount over for a one-time depreciation. So over a ten-year period, this depreciation number will always be one hundred dollars a year, but this number keeps going down. And the next year it's going to be eight hundred dollars, and then it's going to be seven hundred dollars, and it's going to keep going down. Okay, questions about that so far? Make sense? Good. Can somebody explain <coughs> anything in that? Mm -hmm. All right. So that's so that's so that's what that's another thing component that gets in there. We got depreciation. Um, I'll skip amortization for now. I'll get to that in a minute. Um, the the next thing that's listed in there is is interest on debt. Well, uh, actually, what we've done here is we the two next two items: interest on debt and uh, return on shareholder investment. Those are really the two components that make up this return here. And how does that work? Well, ignore these numbers for a minute. Let's get, get uh, let's, look at, let's, let's, let's look at some other pretend numbers. Uh, when, when you decide to build new facilities, um, you can really only get your money from two places if you're a, if you're a privately owned corporation. You can get money from your investors. And you do that by selling stock. Or you can go out and borrow money. That's debt. And, um, and the, conven the, reason, the convention is, well, you want to have a mixture of debt and shareholder investment. Shareholder investment is called equity. So you want a mixture of debt and equity. And it's not atypical for a utility to try to have about a 50-50 mixture of debt and equity. Now, why, now why, do you want, why do you want to have a mixture like that? Well, the simplest way to think about it is that on the equity side, let's just think about a common stockholder, somebody who's just a regular old investor who's bought stock. On the ex equity, equity side, someone is giving you an amount of money to buy a share of stock in the hopes that you're going to turn around and make them some money. You're going to, you're going to get them some dividends. And that. But there's no guarantee. It's not a promise. You're saying, we're going to do our best. The problem is you're going to do your best to make some money, but there's no guarantee that's going to make them any money. On the other hand, when you borrow money, you have a legal obligation to pay it back, right? So, now, so why, well, so, so the question is, why do you have a mixture, though, the two? Well, uh, because uh, in any particular industry, investors are going to demand a certain level of return on their investment. They want they have possibility of earning a certain amount. And, and remember in the cases that we're going to talk about a little later, uh, the courts talk about having that return on the investment reflect the level of risk that's perceived in that particular industry. The riskier an investment is, the more you want to get back at worst. Right? The less risky it is, the more you're willing to tolerate a lower return on your investment. People talk about blue chip stocks, for instance. Some of the some of the things that used to be considered like that, General Motors or IBM or these, these old fossilized companies that and kept trucking along and made their good products and, and brought in some money year after year, and the stock would be 
relatively stable in price, and the returns would be modestly low, but they would be steady. Every year, you can expect to get your, your uh, dividends. And uh, but on the other hand, when people start investing in dot coms or investing in uh, in, in, in medtech stocks, uh, the, there was more risk attached. A lot of these businesses would start out without any any product to sell. So you'd be investing in something that hopes to develop a good product to sell later. And so people say, well, you know, I want to make sure that I've got to get a chance to get a lot of money because this is a very risky investment. And so people people look at that. And, and so so fundamentally, the cost of the, 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 the ex expectation of investor is going to be for a higher return that you're probably going to have to pay through debt. Following the press the last week, the, you know, the prime rate has been reduced a couple of times trying to stimulate the economy. The cost of debt in the United States is really relatively low right now. Okay, so if, if you want to keep your overall cost down, you want to have as much debt as possible. And, you know, if you, if you have, let's say you have more than 50% debt. Let's say you're trying to be almost 100% debt. That would be referred to as being highly leveraged. Leverage means that you really don't have a lot of money. You can borrow a lot of money, but you've got to pay people back. So the good news is your cost of carrying this investment is going to be relatively low. Because let's say your, your average cost of debt is 5%, and, uh, you, and your expected return on your investment is 11% if, you, if it's an equity investment. right? So the more debt you have, the lower your costs are going to be. But the more debt you have, the riskier you are because you actually have to pay it back. This is only an aspiration. This is a legal requirement. Okay, so. So you get a mixture of these two, and it's a blended mixture of the equity and the debt that produces what we refer to here as the rate of return. So it's a return on equity, and it's payment of interest, or otherwise called the return on debt. Everybody, no one seems to be asleep. Anybody following this? Is this making sense up to this point? Um, Jessica? Can, I'm sorry, can you, this is all very new for me. Can you okay. just, um, repeat the last point about the combination of, I followed you all the way through equity and debt until yeah. that that balance of equity and debt <coughs> is the rate of return that you're aiming for? No, or? well, let, you know, Sorry, that, maybe I can show you the way, that no, this point. is a great question, maybe I can show you the, the way it works. If you, you know, again, I'll make the numbers simpler. Instead of 11% and 5%, let's say, let's say 10% and 5%. All right, so uh, let's say you have 50% uh, debt and 50% equity. Right. So for the capital investment, you have the rate base. Half of it comes from selling stock, and half of it comes from selling bonds. Bonds are the way you borrow money when you're in a corporation like a utility. Okay. So it's, let's say it's 50% of each. Okay. And so you know that for the equity component, so let's say you're getting made $1,000 that, we, that we've got in our rate base. And we're saying that half of it comes from debt, half of it comes from equity. Then. Your rate of return is going to be 10% times 500, which equals 50. And it's going to be 5% times 500, which equals 25. Right? So you add the two together, and the rate of return, the blended rate of return for the, for the year is going to be $75. That's the amount of money you're making. That's one way to look at it. The other way to look at it is since it's 50-50, you've got half of it at 10%, half of it at 5%. So it means on average, the rate of return is at least 7.5%. Right, because if you took 7.5% times $1,000, you'd come up with 75. Okay, so when, when, uh, when, there's, when you ask a company, well, what's your rate of return? Uh, then they, they're either going to tell you, they're either going to give you this number, they're going to say, well, because of the way we blend our debt and equity, you know, if you look at our overall investment, we're getting an, uh, an overall return of 7.5%. Or they're going to ask you, well, what are you talking about? Are you talking about our debt or our equity? Because they're different. We can tell you what, what, we're, charging, what we're charging for our equity investment. That's 10%. And the debt uh, is 5%. Right. So is that, is that helping? Getting any closer? And by the way, just to add another layer of complication, um, all the debt's not going to be at the same level because you're borrowing money over, over time. You know, you're smart in your dollar average. Borrow some today and some around some today. Day after, that way, you know you're less likely to get stuck with doing most of your borrowing when the, when the costs are really high. So, so you're not going to have all the debt. Let's say at five percent, you might have some at four and a half, some at six, and some at seven. So you're going to get a weighted cost of debt. You're going to take all the debt and put it together.
together and average it out and say, well, this is what the cost is and the average for our borrower. Rebecca? So when a, uh, a corporation like PG&E or whatever puts out bonds um, and with a specified rate of return, uh -huh. is it the an energy commission that determines that rate of return, like the specific one for that? Well, there, there, there are two things going on. So the question is, if it, let's say you have a utility that's selling bonds. Who determines what the, what the cost is of the bond? Is that is well, in the rate of return, yeah. All right, well, uh, there are two things that happen. First, uh, the bond has to be sold in the marketplace. And no one's going to buy the bond unless there's a, a proper relationship between the risk of that bond and the amount you're going to pay them, right? So first thing you need to do is go out and find, see if people are going to be interested in, in carrying your bonds, putting them out there in the market. And they're going to rate your bonds. They're going to say, well, we think you're a particularly low-risk company. You're a triple-A company, the best kind we can think of. And so we're going to allow you to, we're going to endorse you selling your bond at the lowest interest rate possible. But if it's instead, if it's a double B or some, some other rating that's considered to be less favorable, then the, uh, the, markets, the Wall Street firms might insist that you pay a higher return on your, on your bond. Right. So that's going to be established out in the marketplace. And then the utility's going to turn around and say, all right, we need to, you know, this is cost of service rate making, so we need to have the cost for these bonds included in our, our revenue requirement. And so then they're going to say, well, we, you know, because we're considered kind of risky these days, we have to promise to pay a really high return. So, uh, so they might come in with a higher number. And, uh, and in their, if you look back at this description of what was going on in the, in the, uh, uh, the Wisconsin model for, for cost of service regulation, part of what they required was before the utility went out and sold more stock or floated some bonds, they have to come to the commission and get permission. So the commission's going to ask them, well, you know, what kind of rating do you have and what do you think you can sell these bonds for? Uh, for? And then the commission will either say, yeah, go ahead and do it, or they'll say, no, it's going to be too expensive. We don't want then by the time they come in and ask for their rates, they've already gotten a blessing on what they've done. And so then they're going to be allowed to average that, that cost of debt into the rate of return. So. All right. Uh, well, I'm going to have to give you a reprieve. This is more economics and finance than you probably ever wanted to hear. So uh, why don't, let's take a break, and then when we come back, I'll talk a little bit more about this, and then talk about, uh, about regulation and how we do it, and then we'll talk about those cases. So let's take, uh, you know, let's take 10 minutes.
one yet? Yeah. <laughs> Any epiphanies? All right. Um, let, let's let's let, let me let me try to, to run through a, a, a couple of things more. Oh, there's a race my list. Okay. Well, we, we, we have we have we have the list that's still up on the on the board on the screen right there. But we're we're building up what we're going to refer to as a revenue requirement. We're under cost of service approach to setting rates. And it's going to have two components to it. The first question is, what's the revenue requirement? And then, you know, let me explain, you know, let's understand what that revenue requirement is. That's the best understanding the regulators have about how much money this company should need to collect in order to cover its costs and have an opportunity to earn a reasonable return on its capital investment. Right? So then so the first question is what's the revenue requirement? And the second question is, based on that revenue requirement, how are you going to design rates? So you go from re revenue requirement to rate design. And we'll talk really, we'll talk about rate design in particular next week, but fundamentally it's a notion of saying, all right, this is how much we think we can sell. This is how many units we can sell. This is how much money we need to collect. So let's divvy all that up. Let's get back to the lemonade stand for a minute. They know, their, their, their projection is that they're gonna sell 100 glasses of lemonade. They spent 10 bucks on setting everything up and getting the supplies. And so they need to get, what, at least 10, 10 cents per cup of lemonade in order to uh, cover the revenue requirement. Getting all the money back they need to. Christopher? Oh, never mind, I'll wait. Okay. All right. Um, so, so what we've been doing is trying to build up the revenue requirement. We're trying to figure out what the components of that revenue requirement are, right? So we talked about operating expenses. We talked about, uh, about depreciation. And we talked about uh, return on investment. And so what else do we have to think about? Well, uh, we have to think about things like income taxes and, uh, and also another important one is franchise fees. What does franchise fee mean? It means that even though you might have a state agency that's regulating this company, giving them permission to go into service, uh, in order to actually provide service within the jurisdiction of an individual city or county, the utility has to enter into a franchise agreement uh, with that city or county. And over the course of time, local well, governments figured out they could charge for that. So, all right, fine, we'll, we'll enter into a franchise agreement with you, but, but we, want you to, we want you to pay us, let's say, 1% on all of your gross sales, for, just, for example, 1%, 2%. Utilities, of course, are going to say, all right, that's fine, we'll do that because we know we can then have that included in our revenue requirement, and we'll get it back. Right? We'll get that money back, so fine, we'll, we'll do that. All right, so now all the normal operating expenses, the salaries, the rents, uh, the supplies, you have depreciation on the, on the capital investment, a return, of, uh, a return on that investment, and, and taxes and other things like that. Those, those are, are the, the, the items that make up the revenue requirement. So you add all those up, and you determine your revenue requirement based on that. And this is a forward-looking process. In other words, we're trying to figure out how much you're likely to need, let's say, next year, or over the next two years, or next three years. Right? And it's not backward-looking. We're not saying, all right, we're going to give you money now to pay you back for your expenses last year. It's forward-looking. But you do it based on the way they've been spending money up till now. You look at the expenditures and you ask, well, have they been reasonable about that? Okay, they spent all this amount of money on wages. Was that, was that good or bad? Was that okay? Should we let them earn, uh, get all that money back? This is how much they spent on trimming trees or on, uh, on repairing equipment. Is this, is this a good amount of money to be spending on these things? And then you make that decision based on what they did before, what you're projecting they're gonna do in the future, and you 
set the rates for the future that way. Jason? Uh, the projections don't pan out. Can they recover the shortfall next year in the revenue requirement? The question is if the, if the projections don't pan out, can they make up the difference later? Uh, and the, the basic answer is no. Under this model, they live or die with the revenue requirement they, they get in the proceedings. Right now, so before we talk about what these regulatory agencies are, let's just try to think about human nature. Right? If you know that, and you're a utility, and you're coming in and asking for a certain amount of money, what are you going to ask for? Are you going to ask for the smallest amount you possibly could survive with? Or are you going to want to cushion that a little bit? And if you're a regulator and you want to show that you're protecting consumers, are you going to really want to give the utility everything you'd ask for? Probably not. So you have this game that's played where you, you know, the utilities have to kind of pad their request a little bit and then the commission has to try to figure out how to, how to squeeze it down to what's actually reasonable. And, uh, and so under this model, uh, no, there's, you don't have any way to, to catch up later. Now, further in the course, we'll talk about how that model is eroded over the course of time and how regulators have been willing to give the utilities various kinds of concessions for various kinds of costs that they have, things that they think are really risky. They say, well, you couldn't have known exactly how much you're going to have to spend on natural gases because you didn't know what the price was going to be, so fine. We'll find a way for you to true up. But the legal concept underlying all of this is that you can't set rates retroactively. You have to do it on a going forward basis. And to overcome that and allow for adjustments meant creating a legal fiction or two, finding a way to justify going back. And we'll talk about that later. So it's a really good question. And you'll get parcel satisfaction now and maybe a little bit more later. All right, so I want to emphasize, let's, let's talk about a couple of terms related <coughs> to rate base. Remember the cost of service reflects not only the expenses, but it reflects this concept of rate base, this capital investment made up of equity and debt. And, uh, and the question is, you know, how big should that pot be? Is it a matter of the utility just coming in and saying, here's how much we spent, that's our rate base, thank you very much? No. They have to come in and they have to, to prove to the commissions that in fact, that's what they spent, number one. And number two, that that was the right amount to spend. And when we talked about the cases that you read, we talked about the cases you read for this week, there were a couple of concepts that get thrown around. One is the concept of a plant being used and useful. And we'll see that popping out in the cases, but let's let's just talk about what that means. Because this is really this is a standard that applies in most of the Wisconsin style states, which is just about all of them. And what it says is that if you need a new power plant, let's say, you're gonna have to go out and build it at your own risk. And when it's all done, you come in, come in and show us that the plant's up and running. And once it's up and running, we'll talk about including the cost of that plant in the rate base. Before it's in the rate base, don't bother us because we're, we're, we're not going to put it in the rate base. That's what, that's what use and useful. So not, not only is it being used, but also it's something that's necessary. So in theory, if a particular plant made sense at one point, but later becomes obsolete, You've got it, it's still, you can still use it, but you're not using it or it's not useful for some reason, then it should be taken out of rate base under this theory. Then there's the concept of prudent investment or reasonable investment. And there are a couple of aspects to that we'll talk about in the cases, but fundamentally what it means is that dollars shouldn't go into that rate base unless it was prudent for you to have spent them. Say it another way, if you could have built it for $100, but you built it for $150, we may not let you put the full $150 in your rate base. We might only let you put the $100 in the rate base. Yeah, you might have actually spent the $150, but it's because you were imprudent. You didn't, you didn't use reasonable business judgment. Yeah, and, and so we're not going to let you get the full amount. That wasn't much of an issue for many, many years, but then when you get into the 60s and 70s and the 80s, utilities are trying to build nuclear power plants and the costs of these plants coming in at multiples of what they thought they were going to be initially. And there was a lot of pressure on the regulators not to let all that cost get reflected in rates. Then regulators started looking really hard at whether they thought the expenditures were reasonable. But it's a dangerous game because it's after the fact. You go out and you say, here's an, that's an example with a rate base where you do spend the money first 
and get, the, get your investment back later. The rationale is, well, it's used and useful now, and so you can earn on it. But the, the danger, again, of course, for the, for the utilities is that hindsight's 2020, right? You know, the plant was built, everything looked good, and then suddenly it blew up, and you had to rebuild part of it. You know, so the question is, are all those costs the cost of building and then the cost of rebuilding, should those go into rates? Well, you're answering that question with the benefit of already knowing that it blew up. Right? So that's going to probably color your judgment to some extent. You say, well, you know, you shouldn't have let it blow up. I mean, you should have been able to anticipate that kind of problem and keep it from blowing up. That's, that's 2020 hindsight. And so, uh, you, know, there were, you know, Katie was raising some great issues last week about risk. But, uh, and we talked about just normal business risk and investment risk. But we also talked about regulatory risk. Well, this is what's considered to be part of regulatory risk, where, where you're building this plant and you're hoping everything's going to work out, but you really don't know that the regulators are going to let you put the full cost of it in your rate base until it actually happens. So that's a bit of regulatory risk. And uh, so that's an important thing to know for the cases that we're, we're reading uh, now. Uh, to throw out two other concepts that are, uh, you know, that are kind of a deviation of what we just discussed. One is this notion of construction work in progress. And uh, and that's allowed in some instances. Let's talk about it in one or two of the cases. It's, it has the acronym QUIP. We haven't used many acronyms yet, and I hope to use very few of them, but there are a lot in this industry. And uh, what, so what QUIP uh, says is that, well, it's going to take you a long time to build this new plan. And, and, and it's hard for you to carry all of that debt and all that cost without getting any return on it. So we're actually going to let you come to us as you're building it. Tell us how much you've spent, and we'll let you get some of that back as you're going along. That's what construction work in progress means. Allowance or funds used in during construction just means that when you come in uh, and ask for rate-based treatment once the plant's used and useful, don't just tell us about all of the dollars you spent. You know, you know, don't just tell us it cost you a million dollars in stocks and bonds in order to do this. Also tell us about how much interest you had to pay while you were waiting to get, for it to get finished. Tell us about the cost of the engineers and, and uh, the architects we needed to hire to plan the project. Talk about the salaries of the people who were waiting for the thing to get online. Add up all those costs that you incurred during the time that you were putting this project together and pay yourself interest on it. Get all that accrued and then tell us about it. If it's reasonably spent, that goes into rate base too. And that's, that's what the concept of AFDDC or allowance for funds used during construction. Any questions on that? Josh? So, uh, so you said 500 was to use during construction and then charge and then add interest to it. In other words, what that what that money could have been spent for? Right. Well, if, if you're, you're reflecting the fact that there's that there's some cost attached to spending a dollar on day one when you're only going to be able to start. you ought to get back the lost opportunity from not being able to spend that money on something you earned in your own rate. Right. Any other questions? <coughs> Construction work in progress, it seems like a loan on a loan, is that not? That yeah, that yeah, that's right. It is sort of a loan on a loan. So Construction work in progress, that's, it's not used in many jurisdictions because also it doesn't necessarily take into account whether the utility is imprudent in its activity in building the plant. Right. So, uh, it's subsidized. Yeah. And you know, you know, I don't know how many of you have taken any finance courses or taught or, or, or thought about investments, for instance, in public facilities. But the uh, state of California, for instance, right now, uh, is running a deficit. And what they've done in some of the last couple of years is they've gone out and borrowed a bunch of money to pay off the deficit. <laughs> they owed money, so they went out and borrowed money. Now they owe more money, and they paid off. They, you know, they balanced the budget with borrowed money. Uh, well, that made a lot of people very nervous because the theory would be that if something is providing a benefit today and only today, then you want people who are getting that benefit today to pay for it. Now, if something is going to provide benefit over a long period of time, then you might want to find a way to let people pay, off, pay for that benefit over a long period of time. So the theory is 
You might float a bond if you're a city. You might float a bond to build a bridge, because the bridge is going to be there for 50 years. People are going to get the pleasure of it. So yeah, you're borrowing a bond now. It's a 30-year bond. And not only are you going to pay it back, but your children are going to pay it back. But that's OK, because they're going to get to use it. They'll get the benefit of that. But you don't, borrow, you don't float a bond to give you the money you need to pay your salary if you're in Sierra or two. Or, uh, or in the case of the state, you don't borrow float a bond just to pay off the street expenses. Because in effect, you're, what you're doing is you're deferring that debt and making your kids pay for it. So same concepts apply here. You don't want to, you don't want to uh, go go too far in either direction. You want to pay too much now because the benefits actually going to come later. On the other hand, you don't want to let today's beneficiaries off the hook entirely. And that's why sometimes they think, well, maybe it's a better balance to share the risk between the beneficiaries who are the ratepayers and the investors who are the utility and let them get some of their money back while they're while something like construction. That's a concept. You don't see it in a lot of places now, but that's what it's all about. Other questions? All right. Uh, I saw you get back to amortization. Let me just mention, mention this quickly. All that amortization means for the purposes of this discussion is that you spend a certain amount of money and you want to, you're going you're gonna to collect that money over a number of years. So you spent 100 bucks and you're going to get paid back $10 a year. You're amortizing the $100 over a 10 year period. That's all that, that means. And what a, when, when it, you're using it in a utility concept, uh, context, you can use amortization to describe that, what, that's, you know, what depreciation, depreciation is. In effect, you're taking the capital cost and you're amortizing it over a number of years through the depreciation payment that's reflected in the revenue requirement. That's one way to think about it. But usually, when the term's used in these cases, it's differentiating what happens when you put something in rate base and you allow a utility to earn a profit, a return on that investment. It's differentiating, differentiating that from what happens when you decide for one reason or another that you're not going to allow the utility to earn a return on its investment. We see that in, in, in one or two of the cases that we're looking at today, where there was an investment made, it was not considered to be prudent, or maybe it never became used and useful. But, so, so, but you're saying, well, we might allow you to recover on a dollar for dollar basis, the amount of money you spent, but we're not going to let you earn a profit. That's the way depreciate uh, amortization is often used in these utility cases. Questions about that? All right. Um, so talk about the fact that it's a forward-looking process. You pick a particular historical year, and then you use information that year to help you predict the future. That's a test year rate-making process. You can't make set rates retroactively actively. Um, uh, there was a time when, when the big utilities would have their rates reset every year. First of all, the process was a pain in the neck because the process proceeded to take all year. And, and so that was awful and tied up a lot of valuable resources. But the other thing is, getting back to the incentives we were talking about last week, where should the risk be and where should the motivation be? If you know you're going to have your rates set every year, then people are going to look back at what your expenses were the year before, and that's going to be a major part of their deciding what to do in the next year. Do you ever have any motivation to actually get more productive, to actually reduce your costs? Because if you, you know, if you reduce your costs, then, then you're just going to have your rates go down. Right? Well, when people say, well, on the other hand, let's instead of setting rates every year, let's set them every three years. And you'll know at the beginning of year one what your rates are going to be for three years. And you know that any money that you can save, you get to keep. It's yours. So if you cut your costs, that's going to be money in your pocket. And you got three years to enjoy that. And the theory is that that would provide more motivation for the utilities to actually find ways to make their processes more productive, get more efficient in the things they do, find new equipment that's cheaper, or find new processes that work faster. And, and so the, the notion of having multi-year rate cases uh, came into play. Uh, concept of attrition adjustment, all that meant was, well, <coughs> all right, we're going to give you multi-year rates, but we ought to give you some protection if there's a lot of uh, hyperinflation the next year. You know? So year one, you have your rates at a certain level. Year two, suddenly, there's 10% inflation. An attrition adjustment would allow you to go in and tweak the rates a little bit to reduce to reduce that particular risk. You say, well, all right, you, know, you, you didn't know you were going to get double-digit inflation this year, so we'll allow your rates to go up a little bit to reflect that. Um, actually, I'll get, back, I'll get back to this later. Um, Right, so, uh, 
So we've, we've, talk, we've talked about the economic underpinnings for regulation. And hopefully, if you go back and think about the first reading we had for last week, this will dovetail, and you see, you'll see how this economic analysis, this sense of the benefits of having a monopoly for certain kinds of industries, but also the risks in, uh, uh, inherent in, in relying on monopolies to set rates and provide service, uh, that was used as one of the fundamental rationales for regulation. Of course, the other big one, that we talk about, which appears in Mud versus Illinois, especially, is this notion of certain enterprises being invested with public interest, being affected by the public interest. And, uh, and you, know, you see that you said, see that also in some of the other older cases. Uh, this notion comes from the English common law that, that if there's an enterprise that is so important to the functioning of society that you can't risk for people to take advantage of their ability to provide that good or that service, then it may be subject to economic and so it's really the combination of these two concepts, the natural monopoly concept and uh, protection of, of an enterprise affected by public interest that becomes a rationale for this kind of cost of service rate making that we're talking about. Uh, so, so the question is, what, what do these regulatory agencies that are providing these services look like? And uh, so let me just t talk briefly about what, the, what, what uh, these commissions look like. And, and then let's talk about the cases that try to examine the limits of the authority of these commissions. Uh, California is, uh, is kind of a, uh, of a you know, 10 times multiplied monster compared to a lot of the commissions in other states because the state of California is so big. Uh, but, uh, but basically, the model of the way the California Commission functions is not dissimilar in a lot of ways from others. There are five commissioners in California. They're appointed by the governor. They serve six-year terms. The terms are staggered, so you don't get you know, a new wave of commissioners all on the same day. And, uh, and once they're, they're appointed by the governor, and then they're confirmed by the state senate. In California, they have one year to, to make that decision. And uh, if they don't confirm somebody within a year, then they're definitely not in office anymore, and the governor has to replace them. This is a song and dance that goes on a lot, especially when the legislature is controlled by one party and the governor is from another party, such as, for, for instance, right now. So there's a commissioner, uh, uh, Tim Simon, who has been in office for almost a year, and, and the uh, state senate has just sort of not gotten around to scheduling his confirmation hearing, and they're waiting until the very end. And part of it is they, you know, they want to make sure that he behaves himself, at least for one year, before they're going to be willing to, to give him the blessing of state for the additional five years. So that kind of process goes on all the time. But these agencies are, are extremely powerful, and that's part of what we're going to see when we look at hope, the cases that come after hope. And, uh, and so once these, these uh, commissioners are confirmed, uh, they basically have, I think, the powers that are very similar to, for instance, the Supreme Court, you know, where a president uh, might appoint somebody to the U.S. Supreme Court that's confirmed by the Senate. In that case, they sit for life. But these are not life appointments for the commission. But on the other hand, the theory is that the court is outside of the control of the political process. And the only way you can get judges out of office is to impeach them. Well, it's the same thing with the commissioners. California, if you look at the back of the California phone, phone book, uh, state employee phone book, there's a, uh, a bunch of boxes with an org chart. It shows the governor at the top and a bunch of agencies connected to the governor. And then there's a box for the PUC, and it's not connected sits all by itself, because the theory is that it's an independent agency, and it's not in the direct influence of the governor. We'll talk later about how clever governors and politicians have found ways to kind of change that, that, that relationship a little bit, but that's, that's a theory in any event. So the commissioners can't figure all this out on their own. They can't, they can't decide, they can examine the revenue requirements for all the utilities, or do the other things that utility regulators do, because we don't just set rates. They also decide whether it's okay to build new power plants or build new transmission lines. And they also uh, entertain complaints. Maybe a customer comes in and says, you know, you got a bunch of rules set up in this, this utility, and they're violating the rules. And so the commission will sit like the police and try to figure out what's going on and decide whether the utility has to, to make amends in some form or another. Uh, and the commission undertakes its own investigation, its own policy-setting proceedings. It tries to decide what 
what the industry is going to look like going forward. It sets rules and has, has lots of hearings and public debate. And you know, California is a big place, 30 million people. Five commissioners can do all this. But anyone particularly tiny, about 500 cases pending before the commission of one kind or another. So they have a staff to help them take care of it. In the case of California, it's a big staff. You know, there, there are a bunch of, uh, well, first of all, each of the commissioners has advisors, legal advisors, technical advisors to help them figure out what's going on. Then there are administrative law judges like me who preside over hearings. You know, they, they, uh, if we, take, we take evidence. It's very much like a court of law. I sit up on a bench, I swear in witnesses, uh, people testify, there's cross-examination, I mark exhibits and allow them into evidence or don't allow them into evidence. Uh, fortunately, the only thing I don't have to do is wear a robe. <laughs> but, uh, but they, you know, so, so it's, it's a very much of a, of a, a traditionally styled process. And when, uh, when I get done with a particular proceeding, I make a recommendation to the commission about what they ought to do. And that recommendation is in writing, and it's usually pretty lengthy. Uh, it's not unusual in a big rate case, for instance, to write a couple hundred pages, have lots of graphs and charts in it, and but but have a lot of narrative as well. And when I make that decision, it has to be entirely based on the record in front of me. Right, so so you know, consider a big box, and in that box I've got sworn testimony and things people said in cross, which includes what people said in cross examination, and physical exhibits and uh, and uh, briefs that people wrote, uh, laying out the cases, and maybe there's an oral argument or something, and I'll have transcripts and all that. So picture a big box. Whatever I decide has to be based on what's in the box. I can't, I can't get into Wikipedia and see what other people have to say about the issue to make a decision that way. Uh, a lot of people, some people complain about the processes of these agencies being kind of sluggish, business is feeling like this. Oh, it takes so long to do everything. I mean, one of these general rate cases slightly more than a year, usually. Uh, absolutely unimaginable. When you start looking at all the things that have to happen, the utility will file, you know, these are big companies, they'll file you know, a set of things like this. Somebody's got to look them over to see if it's adequate to even go forward with, so that takes a little bit of time. And then people have to analyze that. It's not just the utility saying something and everybody taking their word for it. There are other people who are going to come in and have their say about it as well. And that gets the, 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 the part of the notion of what, what else there is in the staff other than, than these judges I've talked about. There are uh, technical experts who can, can uh, usually have an industry specialty, so we have energy-related experts or telecommunications experts or water or transportation, the other things that are done within the agency. And they'll, uh, they'll uh, look at these applications and try to understand them. They'll also provide technical support and assistance to the judges and to the commissioners when they're trying to figure out what kind of decisions to make. Uh, but also in California, for instance, there's a large section of the staff called the Division of Ratepayer Advocates. And guess what their job is? Their job is to come into these, these administrative proceedings and speak on behalf of the ratepayers. Just like the, the, the Lorax spoke on behalf of the trees. They <laughs> come and speak on behalf of the ratepayers. And, uh, and so they have to have their own technical so they're engineers and they're accountants and uh, they're lawyers working with them. And so, so they're, they're, they're all these different, these all these different groups. So, they, so there also could be a lot of outside parties that want to participate. There are some consumer groups that reg regularly come in the commission proceedings. They have their own lawyers and their own experts. And a lot of times uh, large consumers, large customers, commercial industrial customers will, will hire their own staff and look at these things and critique them and try to argue that the rates ought to be low. Sometimes another utility will come in and argue uh, on behalf of another utility's rates being too high. When does that happen? Well, for instance, if you're Southern California Edison Company and you buy natural gas from Southern California Gas Company, then you might come into the gas company's rate cases and try to argue the rates ought to be lower so you don't have to pay, spend so much for your gas. So, so all of these outside parties have to have a chance to look over all this information that was developed by the utility issue discovery requests, maybe take interrogatories, get a lot of documents to review, have their own experts look at them. And then the expert, then the testimony that's prepared is almost never percipient testimony. It's not somebody saying, yeah, I was on the corner of 5th and Avery at 7 o'clock at night and I heard that screeching sound of those tires. And I looked around and saw that guy hit the pole. It's not that kind of testimony. It's more opinion. I think that the rates are too high. I think that rate of return ought to be lower. 
a reasonable company wouldn't have undertaken this particular activity. You know, that, that kind of opinion. Well, you know, if you, if you take the evidence, you know that, that the only way that opinion testimony can be allowed into, into evidence is if it's provided by an expert. And in a court of law, you probably have what's called voir dire, where you, you ask a lot of questions of that person who's holding him or herself out to be an expert to test their expertise and see whether they really should rely on their opinion. We tend to skip a lot of the voir dire in our proceedings because we see the same experts all the time. But that's what it is. You have a bunch of dueling experts, economists and engineers and accountants and a bunch of other people coming in and talking about the way the commission ought to interpret the evidence they have. And so, so you, you need time to, re to review the utilities filing. You need time to produce your own testimony. The, the direct testimony is not usually oral. It's in writing so that everybody has a chance to look it over and critique it as well and then know how they're going to respond to it and decide what kind of questions they're going to ask. That all takes time. Then you hold the hearings. Hearings often can run from anywhere from a day to a month or two months. It depends on how complicated a particular issue or case is. And then there's a period of time for writing briefs. And then there's, there's uh, uh, you know, time for, the, for the, uh, the esteemed judge to sit back and try to figure out what the hell to do with all that stuff. And then, and then it goes before the commission. And there, and there are even requirements about how much time there has to be between the time the commission gets it and the time they make a decision. Under California law, the judge's decision has to see the light of day and be out there for at least 30 days before the commission votes on it. And during that period of time, there's an opportunity for another round of comments or two from, from the parties. Well, so what happens, you're a new commissioner, you come into this environment and say, God, this is this bureaucracy. It's just terminable. And we got to get around this. We need to make decisions. We can't be sitting back and, 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 and just, just delaying all the time. And you know, it, it, it really is, is, is a mixed bag. And, and, but, the, but the fact is that there's, there's actually a reason for all of this. I mean, what, what the commission does in California, for instance, affects tens of billions of dollars of the state's economy. It's, and it's a, it, there's, there's hardly any kind of, any comparable agency. So people's rights and their interests are being affected all the time. And due process has, um, has a major role here, making sure that everybody has an opportunity to be heard and a fair opportunity to critique the other person's arguments and present their case. And, uh, and, and the, the result of, the, of having this level of process is that it actually does, in many instances, wind up empowering outside groups or individuals to the extent that they can have a big influence on the results. And there, there are all kinds of cases, instances of that uh, over, the, over the California Commission's history. Natural Resources Defense Council, for instance, has had a major role in, the nature, in defining the nature of, of the uh, utilities energy efficiency programs and how the utilities get rewards or punishments for the way they operate those programs. Basically because they care, you know, they went out and hired experts and then they came in and they made their case, right? Uh, there uh, there uh, are, are cases that we'll read about for next week where other kinds of groups have come into commission proceedings in ways you might not expect and had an influence over the process. By and large, these uh, staffs are, uh, they're any, they run anywhere from good to expert. There's some very, very fine people on the staff. There are probably about 900,000 people in the commission staff in California, so you figure the size of this state, you can ramp down and think about how, how the fact that a lot of other states have maybe fewer commissioners, certainly fewer judges, fewer lawyers. I didn't mention the fact that there's a big fleet of lawyers. That's probably important to you guys. There's a whole legal division with people who advise the commissioners and, and, and uh, represent the ratepayers and do all sorts of other things, including representing the people of the state of California in proceedings before federal agencies or federal courts. We've talked a little bit about the fact that you've got a regulatory structure within the states. You also have uh, a fairly comparable structure on the federal level called the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, which we've talked about a lot, uh, that, that does have an influence over, over utility and rates of services as well. And we'll talk about what that looks like. So sometimes the, the lawyers at the PUC in California will be doing the work before the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission and other agencies like that. Um, the, the, I guess the other thing I want to just want to mention and this will, this will probably make sense when you think about how the cases are following. These agencies are extremely powerful. Now, think about the fact that you know, we're going to talk about these cases where there was, there was uh, the legislature tinkering with rates, the courts tinkering with them, and then these, these agencies being created. Uh, the hope was that, that by having these agencies that were dedicated to dealing with these utility issues, they would have the benefit of expertise that maybe the legislature might not have, or the courts might not have. And you have the benefit of the new 
centrality involved in having this agency and not have a box attached to the other boxes that are attached to the government. And so, there, so the notion was that you create an independent agency, you're going to get fairer and more expert results. That was the theory. And, and the result of implementing that theory is that you have agencies that are almost impervious to legal review. In California, the, the uh, cases, uh, the decisions issued by the commission for many decades were reviewable only by the state Supreme Court, and only if the court uh, accepted cert. So there was no obligation for the court to ever hear any of the PUC cases. And uh, for many years, they took maybe on average maybe one or two a year. You know, and, and you know, out of the hundreds that were issued, that meant that, that the chances of having any particular case return, uh, appealed successfully and overturned was about zero. Well, over the last 10 or 15 years, the Supreme Court of California has taken basically none. And there's been some modification. Now there's an intermediate court of appeals that can sometimes elect to hear some cases. So there are a few more that are being argued, but, but uh, not many are being argued. The commissioners know that. And they know that they, they can probably stretch the limits of the law a fair amount when they want to. That could be really dangerous. It could be potentially unfair. And that's one of the reasons that these cases become really important. Because the question is, what are the courts going to do in terms of defining the breadth and the limits of the power and authority of these agencies. When they do take the cases, when they actually think about these things, what are they going to have to say about them? All right, so we have the cases, so we'll get into them. Any questions first about the structure of the agencies? Chris? Um, a lot of the cases described in the PUC and, and utility commissions in general as arms of the legislature, but I had always thought that agencies and commissions and things like this were part of the executive branch. Can you go into that? Yeah, that, that's a really good question. You don't have to hear the question. The question is, well, don't the courts think, think of these agencies as arms of the legislature, and, uh, uh, but, but aren't they really part of the executive? Well, they're actually, uh, they're probably more closely related to the executive in that they're usually, uh, they're usually staffed and built by the executive. Uh, but the theory is that they're, again, that they're largely independent, and they're really not fish or fowl. I mean, they, there's a lot of talk uh, about the processes for, for instance, California Commission as being quasi-legislative, meaning that they have some characteristics that look like the legislature, and quasi-judicial, because in some ways they look like courts. And, uh, and, and so the question is, you know, which kind of proceedings fit into which category, and what difference does it make anyway? And you know, so for instance, rate cases, since they initially were handled all rate setting was almost always handled by the legislature initially. People tend to think of, of, of rate setting as being a quasi-legislative process, but it but it's not it's not uh, totally a uh, free game. The legislature can usually pass any law it wants. The PUC's limitations are defined by legislation and defined defined by judicial order. So so the, so the commission is in the business even in a rate case of interpreting statutes which seems a little bit more judicial, doesn't it? And then you have cases like these complaint cases I'm talking about look very adjudicative, very much like a judicial proceeding. And, and the law recognizes that difference as well. And then you have a lot of things that tend to fit in the middle. There, there, there are, the commission tends to like to have rulemaking proceedings because rulemaking proceedings seem more legislative and legislatures function differently than courts do uh, in terms of the way they deal with an evidentiary record. Remember that all the stuff is in that box. Well, legislatures have big open boxes and they don't have to care about what's in the box. They can hold, they can have, you know, with all the lobbyists they want and they can, they can uh, uh, have hearings and they want to do that and they can argue among themselves and they can decide what to do. Uh, you know, the, the commission, again, is supposed to be making decisions out of what's in the box. Well, and courts, that's what the courts have to do as well. The last thing you'd ever tolerate would be having a judge on the bench in the Superior Court or a Court of Appeals or the Supreme Court meeting privately one on one with one of the parties to a case. Unheard of. You just don't do that. Uh, but and, and so so here are these commissioners who come out of the political environment and uh, and feel uncomfortable about this big fat sluggish bureaucracy and all the things it does. And so they want to be more like the legislature. So they want to fit a lot of what they do in the ruling proceedings because their ability to have private meetings and their ability to think outside of the box is actually considerably greater in those kind of cases. 
Great question, Sarah. How often do the commissioners like not follow the 200-page opinions that the ALJs write? Uh, how often do the how do often do the cases to the commissioners not follow what the ALJs do? Well, I'd say that if you were to look at all of the cases, uh, you know, taking the uh, the uh, Robert Reich concept of averaging things out, you probably find that you know eight out of ten cases the they just take what the judge wrote and sign it. But the other 20% are going to be the ones they really care about. They're going to be the ones that are most politically controversial. They're going to be the ones that are more heavily lobbied, the ones that members of the legislature and the governor's office are going to be more concerned about, the ones that have the bigger impact. And those are the ones where they tend to get more involved. It t in, in, in when I first started uh, as an administrative law judge many years ago, <coughs> if I wrote a decision the commissioners didn't like, they would tend to sit at it for a while some eggs, and then they voted out. Now, if I, if I write a decision they don't like, they say, thank you very much for your work, and then they have one of their advisors sit down and rewrite it. And then they vote out that other version, the alternative version. Uh, you know, so that, that's much more typical now in the, in the bigger cases. I think commissioners will actually take a big hand in it. What the judge does still defines the process. It sets the stage and defines the debate. And often what happens is that, you know, that if they're you know, if the utility is asking for 100 percent of something, and the, and, and the uh, judge writes a decision that gives them 95 percent of what they asked for, then they're going to come in and talk about how outrageous it was that they didn't get the five percent. So the changes that are going to tend to be made are going to be on the margin, on the fringe, and they're going to tend to usually wind up adopting most of what is in that decision, that two hundred page decision. And imagine with all that talking, <laughs> you can say a lot of things, and you can be suggesting things that really influence the development of public policy. And you can be also making a lot of things that might look like small decisions to the commission but actually have a big impact on people or big impacts on the environment. And that's, that's part of the fun of the job for me, is trying to find ways to do that. Not to be sneaky, but to try to find ways to, to uh, uh, do things that I think move things in the right direction, not only economically, but environmentally. Any others? Well, okay, well, let's, let's start. Let's talk then a little bit about the cases. Um, <coughs> Tyler, did I, did I talk to you last week? I can't remember. We were talking about a case together last week. Uh, you can talk to me last week, no. Well, did you get a chance to look at, there was very little to read you know, related to the Smith versus Daniels case. Uh -huh. uh, or, or the Bluefield case. Did you sure, get a chance to What do you want me to say about it? Well, <laughs> <laughs> understand the essence of the way the court in Smith versus Ames was looking at the regulatory process. Now, this is, a, this is an 1898 decision, and so it's before the time that we're really dealing with uh, energy facilities. Uh, and um, something I think you probably read about is the fact that, uh, that, that the, the regulatory bodies that now regulate energy facilities really grew out of uh, an era where there was regulation of the railroad. And in fact, the California Commission is subject to the Market Street Railroad case, and it's not called the California Public Utilities Commission, it's called the California Railroad Commission. Same place. If you, you know, if anybody come and visit me, I'll show you the big safe that's outside the executive director's office. It says California Railroad Commission. And, uh, and so, so this case is back in that era when we're dealing with, with railroad regulation <coughs> and, and not with, uh, not with uh, energy utilities. So really the question was Smith versus Ames. How, did the, how do you think the court in that case regarded <coughs> the sanctity of decisions that were made through the regulatory process? Um, I think the court in that decision sort of asserted its right to um, overrule those decisions. Yeah. And, <coughs> and what, so what filter were they providing? What, what was the concept they used in trying to decide whether the rates were set appropriately? Well, basically the way, the way I saw it was the decision had more to do with like, the rate base than the rate of return. Mm -hmm. Basically, they said that the, what should be included in the rate base were the fair value of the property being used by the uh, national monopoly for the convenience of the public. Mm -hmm. And, and did, they, did they just have one recipe as to how you define fair value, or were there, were there different questions you could ask in terms of trying to figure out what the fair value is? Um, I, think it, 
I didn't read it as having a lot of specifics. It seemed like later cases were the ones that sort of hashed out various standards for it. It seemed like in this one, what I caught was just the fair return and it said, you know, the corporation isn't isn't necessarily entitled to make a profit, but I didn't see a lot of specifics. Yeah, so so they they were largely looking at, at original costs in this case, weren't they? They were they were asking, well, how much did they spend on this and how much should they be able to return get a, get a return on that investment? And uh, and they, they issued a decision here, but they also made it clear that in the decision that uh, if things change, they, they, might, they might have a different result later. So they very, very much were saying, this is the way we see what's fair for this utility now, and come back to us later if things change. Right? And so, I mean, is it fair to say that the message out of this case is that the courts are ultimately going to make these judgments here. They're going to figure out about what's right and what's wrong. You, you need, so, you're, so you're not going to be relying on the regulators to do that. It's good. Yeah, I mean, I feel like that's what um, the energy law books have said. This is the beginning of the judicial phase. Uh -huh. but, you know, I think that's a, to me, it takes a step too far to say that the courts are always going to be the ultimate, you know, arbiter of the right rate or whatever. It's just that in this particular case, they serve the right to intervene as maybe they always are, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, well, let's, let's, let's move into blue field and think about that. I wouldn't usually ask you to do two, but again, there's so little to read that I'm going to think about that one too. Because I think that you could really look at the world as being pre hope and then post hope. And this is the other pre hope case that I ask you to read here today. Now, this one doesn't involve railroad at all, it involves water companies. And what's at issue here? You, you mentioned that in, in the uh, Smith versus Ames, the question was what should be in rate base? Is that the question here, or is it, or is it a different question? Here? Yeah, and I think this, this is more of a rate of return question, right? Um, and this one they held that the rate of return should be sufficient to um, be able to raise more uh, money, in order to, not to wreck its credit, so they go out and borrow more money for the, in the credit market. Yeah, so, so, the, uh, so Smith, Smith versus Ames is really very formula, formula driven. They're saying, well, we might need to do a certain kind of calculation to come up with results. Is Bluefield, as a court, is Bluefield being as formula driven, or, or are they going more toward results? Uh, I guess I guess it would be more uh, results. Uh -huh. you know, so it's, it's interesting because you know, people talk about you know, we're going to talk about hope in a minute, and, and 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 the question really is why do people see hope as being a turning point? Well, here you are with the Bluefield case, and in the Bluefield case already you've got the court looking more at the results than at the formula. And I'm not gonna not gonna ask you to have to deal with that, Tyler. Okay. I want to talk to Katie instead. See what she thinks. Let's talk about let's talk about the whole case. Is, is that all right? Okay. Actually, let me tell you. Let's talk first, generally, what, what are the circumstances uh, in the whole case? First of all, we've actually finally moved into the, to the world of energy utilities, but is, is it an electric company? Uh, yeah, it's um, a Pennsylvania statute that regulates an electric um, utilities race bait, bait, yeah, rate but base. Hope, but hope is, hope is actually a natural gas company, isn't it? And, they, and, they, and they're supplying natural gas not only within the state where they're producing, but they're also selling it across the board, right? The gas company is actually in West Virginia, and they're selling gas in Ohio and Pennsylvania. And so we're not dealing here with a state regulatory agency. Remember I mentioned the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission? Well, this is its predecessor. This is the Federal Power Commission. And the, the Federal Power Commission is involved here because you have an interstate transaction. And also you have a wholesale transaction. What's the difference? Well, you've got you, one of the utilities is turning around and let's say the utility in Ohio is selling its natural gas to its customer. That's a retail transaction. And they're providing all the services attached to with delivery and billing and they're providing the gas commodity itself. Um, but when they turn around and buy that gas from somebody else, that's a wholesale transaction because they're buying it for resale later, right? And the federal federal regulators deal with wholesale transactions that are 
interstate in nature. So you've got a federal regulatory agency here and not a state agency. But, but you also would find, I think, that it's an agency that's structured very much the same way all these other Wisconsin type of regulatory agencies were structured. And we're in 1944, so we're more into the era of the energy utility regulation. And so we just talked about Smith as being a case that involved what, uh, the question of what should be in rate base. And then Bluefield was more about rate of return. What's the issue with the hook? The hook? Um, well, here the, the court establishes a new um, test, which is the end result test, and it's not going to look at the components. Um, okay, but let's not, let's not get there yet. Are we, are we looking at, at the rate of return? Are we looking at rate base? Or are we looking at something else? Um, I think they were interested in a reasonable return, but also um, allowing the, the regulated entity to maintain its financial integrity and um, ensure future um, capital investment um, and a variety of other. Are they trying to figure out what the value is to put on the rate base? How to define the rate base? Um, I don't think so. <laughs> okay, well, does anybody else have any thoughts about that? Regardless of all, you know, whether or not any of those should control, it doesn't matter because the agency doesn't have to stick to any one formula. Right, yeah, so let's, let's uh, quickly see if we can understand what the distinctions are they're talking about. There's the notion of original, original cost, which looks a lot like what, what I was describing before, isn't it? You, you see how much they actually spent on a nominal dollar basis. You know, how, how many dollars did they spend to build something? And then you, you let them earn on that. And then you depreciate it. You let them earn on the undepreciated part. You keep going back and forth. But, but the, all you're asking there is how much did you spend? And if you're assuming that all these things are true, that's the original cross, cost approach. And then I think you also refer to what's sometimes called trended original cost. And what's going on there is that you're saying, all right, that's how much you spent. We know how much you spent then. But let's inflate that to today's dollars. And then let you earn a return on that. Okay. And then, and then there's what you ought to refer to, I think, as replacement cost. And I mean, we think of you know re re replacement costs uh, when we talk about insurance on our cars. And, and you know, you got you got a ten year old car, and you'd say, well, you know, it got stolen. You know, pay me the replacement cost. You need to buy a new car. And you say, well, no. We're going to actually give you money you need to buy a 10-year-old car. That would be replacing what you lost as opposed to giving you something else. Well, that's not, I think, what they're talking about here. Here they're asking, what would it cost for you to build this facility today? Because actually the word they used was reproduction cost. Yes. Yeah, so what am I going to get replacement cost? Yeah, they actually use those terms get used interchangeably. Yeah, and actually both of them are so it's replacement or reproduction cost. Um, so, so they're saying, well, you know, forget what it costs to build it before. The question is, what would it cost them to build it now? Um, and then, and then, there's, then there's an additional concept, which, which is referred to as present fair values. We talked about fair value even back in the uh, Smith versus Ames case. And there I think they're asking, well, you know, what's the fair amount to put in the rate base? But this concept of present fair value really asks, well, well let's forget about what you spent to build it. Forget about what it would cost to build a new one today. What's this worth? And what is this property worth in the marketplace? If you're going to turn around and sell it, what, you know, what's its value? You know, and so, you know, why would you be asking all these questions? What's wrong with just taking 
the, the, the concept of original cost and just applying that to the case. Why would anybody try to move for any of these other variations? Christopher? Is it because equity decisions are made by investors based upon different different fees? Is that anywhere in place? Yeah, you know, Christopher's saying, well, maybe people who are making e equity investments ask different questions. Maybe they're not asking how much did you spend for it reasonably. Maybe they're asking, well, if I invest in this company, what's the value of what I'm investing in? And I'm interested in seeing how people are earning on that value. That, that, would, be, that would be the question, right? Um, and, uh, you know, what? Sorry. Didn't you also just say earlier uh, this whole process essentially should be a forward looking process? That's right, Eric said, well, didn't you say before this is all supposed to be a forward looking process? Uh, yeah, it's certainly it's supposed to be forward looking at least to the extent that you're asking what do they need to collect, what does the utility need to collect in rates this year coming up as opposed to what it should have gotten last year. But, part of the, but Eric's question is, well, isn't part of being forward looking better looking at the value of the property now and in the future as opposed to what it might have cost to build it in the past? All right. Well, what's a counter argument to that? Why would you say? Why would you say? Well, you really, it's really better to look at the original cost. Why, why would, what would be an argument? Well, it is actually the money that they spent. So why should they get to profit on the fact that you know there's been inflation? I mean, right. because the thing is worth more now, yeah. they didn't, it didn't cost them more. Right. They only spent this. Why should they pretend they spent something else? And it might be less true for like the railroad and the streetcar companies, but for a lot of these utilities, it's not that their market value doesn't make sense because there's not really a market for these things. So it's not, in many of the cases, if it's never going to be sold, then what's the point of understanding its present market value? Yeah, what's the point of knowing its present market value? Why pretend that they might turn around and sell it? They're a regulated industry, and and so you know, so it's really a fiction to imagine turning around and selling. Yeah, because you like to the extent that you're worried about. Uh, Forward looking rather than backward looking. It's right. like all decision about um, how much risk you're going to allocate to the utility versus how much risk you allow the utility to pass on to consumers. Like, right. under one measure, it's like you expose the utility to uh, the risk of inflation. Another measure, you protect from that risk. You know, like, or, or under one measure, it's like exposing to the risk of like increased competition leading to lower than expected returns, leading to like a present value that's like lower. You know what I mean? Yeah, so I mean, Tyler's saying, well, you know, it's all about allocating risk. And the question is, what? What risk do you want to have reflected here? Do you want the utility, you want to say, well, utility, invest, make a judgment today about how much you're going to invest in this facility. But you're running the risk that five years from now, from now, the value of that asset may go down just because the marketplace doesn't value it as much as it used to. Is that the kind of risk you want to take, them to take on? Or are you more really focused on that judgment at the time they make the investment? You know, you know was this a prudent step to take at the time the utility made, took the step. Is that, you know, what, why did, Tyler, I think, is asking, why, did, why isn't that really a more accurate way to assign risk? Because you want, you want them to bear the risk of their decision at the time you're making it. Um, is that, am I being well, clear? I wasn't saying one side or the other. I'm just saying the decision between those I'll four things. Like, like, I'm saying one of yeah. those measures insulates you from inflation, the other one doesn't. Mm -hmm. And one of those measures insulates you from, the, you know, the, your asset losing value faster than expected, the other one doesn't. Right. Yeah. Just recognizing that there are different yeah. risks attached to whether, regardless of which whether you want to pass this risk to consumers or not, yeah. is like you know a question of like how much do you want to expose the utility to risk under mm -hmm. the idea that it'll operate like a free market company and you know do a really good job, and how much do you want to insulate from the risk because it's the only one out there and no one can fail. And so like just let it pass on. So maybe as the regulators and the courts are debating these concepts, they're, they they have different ideas in their minds about risk and how they want to allocate. Josh. I was going to say if you stick with the original cost, while well, they would be attempt. Right. 
So, so choosing, choosing one option or the other is really a matter of deciding whether you want to try to, to adjust for future differences, right? Or whether you want to say, well, no, listen, just make your best decision before. We'll let you earn on that, but don't ask us to try to play with it. You know, those, those are, I think those are all really good questions that are raised here. You can see where the regulators and the courts have, we go through that debate among themselves. And, but hope becomes a landmark in that regard because hope basically says, let's stop this. Let's not get into this game. This is not for, for the courts to decide. This is something for the regulators to figure out. And just show us what result they got. What, what happened as a result of their applying whatever theory they're going to apply. And let's talk about that. But don't get us involved in trying to tinker with the theory and the calculation and the formula. But you know, let, me, let me offer some thoughts on these because we don't have a whole lot of time. You know, when they're saying that, in some ways, they're not all that different from Bluefield, court in Bluefield, right? Because Bluefield court also said, well, we're going to look at the result more than we're going to look at the formula that you use to get there. And so in some ways, you're still being a court that's exerting its judgment. But what's fundamentally different about Hope is that in the Hope case, the court says, look, if somebody brings an appeal to one of these commission decisions, they're going to carry a very steep burden of proof. Somebody's going to say the court, the, the agency did it wrong. They're going to carry a steep burden of proof because the whole reason you have this agency is so you have a body with a high level of expertise. And we're going to assume that they applied that expertise. We don't have it, they have it. And unless can, someone can show us, in effect, that what the court did was, uh, what the regulators did was outrageous, you know, we're, we're not going to pay them. Just show, if you, just tell us whether in the long run the company ended with its head above water or it didn't. It's a classified minute cash check. So, so, uh, so then, then you get to the jurisdiction. Then we talk about jurisdiction, which is also a FERC case. It's a court of appeals case. It happens a good bit later. It's kind of a fun case to read from a historical standpoint because it involves a bunch of characters that actually were involved in other parts of American history. Uh, you got you got Bork. Bork was uh, was appointed to the Supreme Court and rejected by the Senate. Uh, part of the reason he was rejected is that he was the guy at the bottom of the totem pole in something called the Saturday Night Massacre. About that from the uh, when uh, Nixon wanted to fire the special prosecutors, he was trying to get him impeached, and, and and he told the Attorney General to fire him. The Attorney General said no. He said, "Well, you're fired." And he kept going down the line. He got to Bork and Bork said, "Whatever you say." You know, went ahead and fired a special prosecutor. And so the Senate didn't forget that. He got appointed to the Supreme Court, and, uh, and he didn't get confirmed. It also has Kenneth Starr. Remember Kenneth Starr? He was a special prosecutor in the Clinton impeachment. And, uh, and so, uh, so here, uh, the, the, the approach was generally taken. With, here, here the court actually wound up saying, well, regulators, we're not going to tamper with your decision. We're going to allow it to stand. And they got back to make sure. No, they did say, here they reversed. Here they reversed. And then you got to the Duquesne case later. Duquesne is a good case to read because it also, I think, it brings them in together, these earlier cases that we looked at. Um, and, and in Duquesne, the court fairly actively reaffirms position it took in the whole case. And uh, it also winds up uh, providing a lot of deference to the regulators. Um, he had an interesting situation in uh, Duquesne, uh, in, basically because it was a much smaller case. You sort of wonder what happened in the situation of reverse. He had $400 million of disallowance at issue um, in the Jersey Central case, and he had a much smaller amount at issue in the Duquesne case. Um, and, and here in Duquesne, in Duquesne, the court said, well, we're looking at the result because that's what Hope was all about. Uh, the impact here on, on the total assets of the company by adjusting the rate base is going to be somewhere between 1.9 and 2.4 percent, and it's just not a, a big enough deal, and we're not going to reverse it on that basis. Well, i got to let you go, but, but uh, I, think, I think that what, what we've seen has happened is, is there's been uh, a 
a reaffirmation ever since COVID of the fact that these are agencies with expertise that ought to be encouraged. Next, we're going to test the limits of that expertise. We're going to look at a bunch of cases that have to do with things that aren't related to rate base. We're going to see how the courts have, have considered how far they think uh, these regulators ought to be allowed to go. Well, everything's not going to be you know, as sloggy as this. We have to get through some of these technical background foundation building issues. Uh, but uh, look, every individual can just appreciate sticking through this one today. And uh, yeah, hopefully you'll see all of these. Remember to keep your flag.